mortal realms, an old world story phase. Grab your hammer so we can clear a path through the chaos and forge our own narratives in the world that was. Your supporters through the sands this episode are... Hey, I'm Paul. And uh, you know what? Today we're going to be in the world's edge mountains. Or, you know, for those in the know, the, the Derbyshire Dales, which, which are neither old world nor mountains. But, you know, it is what it is. I don't get that. Uh, I'm Aaron. <laughs> and uh, it's a dead man's party. Who could ask for more? It's a dead man's party. Leave your body at the door. Not a dog. <laughs> I didn't sing it, so I think I'm cool. <laughs> It's pretty close. Speaking of dead men, I'm Tristan, and I'm the undead life of the party, uh, dropped in from the mortal realms, uh, here to talk about some old bones. All right. And I'm Will. And guys, what did the Kemrian bring to the canned food drive? What? No, Will. What did he bring? Cetra the (laughs) non-perishable. Oh. (laughs) You don't serve Cetra after the best before date. (laughs) It's because he doesn't have one. <laughs> and he also doesn't kneel. In this episode, we cover the lore of the Tomb Kings of Kemri. Get ready to hear a whole lot of grand titles, creaking bones, and tales from the olden days. And then if we have time after all that, we'll talk about those desert liches. <laughs> How are you tonight, my kings? <laughs> my kings. Uh, tr- true kings, uh, yeah. My wife literally tonight called me her short king, and I was both uh, it was endeared and insulted <laughs> at the same time. It's like, endeared is a, not the word I thought you were going to say there for the positive aspect of that. So I'm mildly disappointed. Yeah, well, uh, one day she may listen to this. Or God, one day my kids might listen to this. Hey, Will, I'm doing great. <laughs> uh, on Aaron's tombstone, I was a short king. Well, no, again, now we're saying it too many times. I think the one the once was enough, and that's sufficient. I don't know, how short is five seven? It's not. Yeah, we don't want him to raise right? up from no. the dead. Uh, I'm also doing great. I'm ecstatic. I'm really excited to be here. I've listened yeah. to almost every single show that's ever been made. So here's to that. All I have to say yeah. is, where's Eric? Cheer, uh, Eric. Where is Eric? Great question. Yeah. I, I ask that all the time. <laughs> Whenever he's not on the screen, the audience should be asking, "Where's Eric? <laughs> where's Eric? I'm feeling great. Paul, how are you? I am doing wonderful." Um, we are expecting a big snow day tomorrow, so I might actually get some hobby done, which would be Ooh, super fun. Oh, that would be nice. Um, my latest hobby has been to paint a single storm cast that I have from Adepticon last nice. year. That's not enough. So, that's, <laughs> that's just like one. That's like one dude. What are, are you going to do with that single storm cast? challenging me on paint time? Is that what's going on here? I feel like the front. <laughs> kind of, a little bit. We'll talk about hobby in, in a moment. No, no, it, um, it's <laughs> fine. I, I really like the paint scheme, so here, I'm going to grab it quick. He's going to grab it quick. In He's the meantime, hey, well, tell me about you. How are you? How are you? Tell me about you. I'm doing good. Um, looking forward to that snowstorm to also maybe hopefully get some hobby done. Oh, my God. Ooh. We're lunatics. I, I, God, this snowstorm is the worst thing that's happened to me, I think, probably ever. Um, <laughs> and then I have so many kids. I don't want a snow day. It, it depends. I just, on had, <laughs> I just had two weeks of uh, break. I, <laughs> I ain't got time for this. It's so much work. Yeah. And raising it's my own children. by respite. <laughs> Raising my own children? What? No, can't do it. No, I don't. Wouldn't even know how. Frankly, frankly, don't call me Shirley. Sounds like a good segue. I <laughs> I'm support your voice. I'm yeah. not running the show tonight. <laughs> right, which is one of the interesting things. I have to wrangle you all together. Uh-oh. Uh oh, good luck. So, Aaron, what have you been doing in the hobby? <laughs> Okay, I'd love to tell you. Um, in that I'm back to filing my gnarlwood terrain, the bane of my existence, and it'll probably kill me. But this is, I don't know, the four, the no, probably the sixth tree, perhaps that I'm on. I don't I can't remember what set it is. Honestly, I can't remember what day it is or what my name is at this point because there's just been so much gnarlwood terrain. Um, but back to the trees, um, and we'll probably until again the the day they put me in the ground. But that's what I've been working on. Norwood trees. Chill. Tristan, what about you? I've I've had a mad dash personally of the last, I don't know, four or five days. I d- did a big respite. I did a big like cleanse of myself and the hobby for like two or three weeks around Christmas where I didn't do anything and I felt terrible about myself. But now... I have done so many things in the last six days. I've built Tomb Guard chariots. More on that later. I've built mm-hmm. skirmishing um, archery uh, horse people with skeletons. Um, I've gone insane and have cut, uh, I think, 15 now snake bows. More on that later. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I've I've made terrain. I've made um, a unit of spiders. 
just because you know i thought i thought yeah, with course. the people here oh, yeah. I, um and you know how tombs have like spiders in them so sure. i actually took the spiders from the um that for skull pass uh, yeah thank you and i t- splayed out all the legs reattached mm-hmm. them in different ways so that way they look they look more creepy and crawly mm-hmm. um and those are the best those are they're they're pretty fun it's incredibly annoying to do and i almost cut mm-hmm. myself twice but thankfully i have a very sharp knife um and you're better the than I. I did <laughs> <laughs> i cut myself Thanks. like a hundred times on those take some work they're thick plastic my dude mm-hmm. um the other thing I've been doing uh, is a whole bunch of the centipedes from the big trog boss kit. Um, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Squishy. Um, yeah. I'm taking that and I'm putting it on a base, removing the fist, and then making it so it's crawling through the sands. So that way, yep. like, each, each thing has its own little creepy crawly. Because, you know, who doesn't love creepy crawlies? And I think I've assembled, um, yeah, okay, so two two out of three. Two out of three. So <laughs> we're at a 50-50 ratio for the podcast. Sure. For yeah. a podcast. I think so. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and let's see what else I've done. I've built, um, this is all in the last like four days. I've built two Ashabti. I've rebased three different Sepulchral Stalkers. I've put paint down on a big um, Necrolith Colossus, as they're known as now, conversion. Nice. I'll show you that one. Um, so you must like Tomb Candice is what you're trying to tell me. <laughs> I'm pretty in. I may have been called into this episode for a reason. Um, and anyway, I built this big uh, Tomb Ooh, King that's made out of like Magnus the Red. The face. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was like using a shoulder pad, but then I hand sculpted a whole bunch of the armor on it. And I green stuff, I blue stuff molded using green stuff, um, like press molds, that's a whole bunch green. of different weapons and stuff. I know, right? It's green, it's blue. What color is it? It's turquoise. And now we're back to turquoise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Back on theme. So my is only that a new is, one that you just put together? Because I um, feel like it's a similar one that you've done. Yeah, so I've done. So I had to rebuild this because it fell from. I took it to a painting class to show people how to do like base coats. So that's gotcha. where the green is from. Um, and I dropped it whenever I was there. So all the weapons that are like pinned together and made out of green stuff all basically shattered and exploded. So I had to reattach everything back on, including the thing to the base. So you're saying you had so to that resurrect. That was fun. Yeah, exactly. So here's my question. Well, it's I'm, more of an arise than a <laughs> resurrection. So you sh- you talked about all this cool stuff that you've done, but the real one lingering question I have is, how did you only assemble two Ushabti? Why didn't you like get a box of three or something like that? Did you get the blister packs? What's going on here? Um, well, my friend Bart, I beat him um, into a bloody pulp the last event that I went to. And to thank me for that, he gave me a bunch of Tomb Kings and he gave me some Ushabti. So <laughs> we we did the classic thing of a whole bunch of talking ish um, before, after, during um the night before somebody showed up with larp swords to the event and so we were sharing a room together of course because we had been talking absolute garbage to one another for the la- for the month leading up to the event and at 1 a.m he strolled in and i just beat him with the sword because he mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. being too loud and i was trying to sleep because i need my beauty sleep <laughs> for whenever i arose mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. but that's why i have two because the wonderful barton kelly gave me a whole bunch of uh Ushabdi as a thank you for beating his ass Nice. If you hadn't beaten him, what would what would he have done with them? I wonder. Like thrown them away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh wow. Probably. So so at this event we had the big bit swap. So I'm pretty sure he was threatening just to put them in the bit swap. Oh, <laughs> like we, everybody, because everybody at the event took like bits to swap thing, and he just would have been like, "Hey Tristan, clunk. There's one. Hey Tristan, clunk. There's two. Hey Tristan, there's thirty tomb guard. What's up now?" <laughs> But unfortunately, I took his head and uh, skull corn does not care from where the skulls come from. There we go. Mm-hmm. I'll drink to that. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me of the end of the old world when uh, we had Cetra talking to corn about what's going to mm-hmm. happen next. Ah, spoiler alerts, man. Um, <sighs> hey, 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 well, I'd love to hear what, what you've been hobbying on as it's of late. Something we're going to just skip past that. Uh, nope. I've been. No. No. I've been spending a lot of time doing a different type of hobby, which is getting together the uh, battle pack for the 2024 Gibbering Dome Adepticon event. Oh, neat. We were just talking about how we need to do a better job. I mean, maybe we don't because it seems like we're doing okay, but we needed to do a better job about advertising our events at Adepticon as a as a network. And I say we very loosely because I have zip to do with it, but um, cool. Uh, 
Is there anything you want to talk about? I mean, I uh, to go find yeah, out. It's going to be a narrative uh, path to glory event. We did a lot of changes from the past years just to make it flow a little bit smoother. There's a lot of cool narrative stuff in there. I'll be the judge uh, of that. But okay. A lot of cool opportunities for people <laughs> to tell uh, an evolving narrative across games and tables. Huh, also, neat. spiders will be there. Yep. Well, a few. Always. Whether you know it or not, you're going to like swallow probably like nine of them or something. Um, what, what when you're sleeping is. at the table. <laughs> that, that doesn't sound like a good advertisement for the event. But so, speaking um, of yeah. being better at advertising, uh, before <laughs> the we, bear's going to be there. Ah. <laughs> uh, before we go into the rest of the episode, we're going to just hit some of our, our standard pre show plugs. Uh, for example, you can find more episodes of this podcast at themortalrealms.com, as well as our other shows, including Dogs of Warcry, Path to Story, and What the Hex. And Tristan, I think you're on a show as well. Ooh, I am. I'm on the show Party at the All Points, available on all places that you find podcasts. So professional. So professional. Yeah. Way more professional than me. I, I just sit here and do nothing. Let everybody else read. do the work. Typed words. Fine. You'll <laughs> listen. You'll get to look pretty in a couple years. It'll be great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It'll just a silver, fade silver in. Silver fox. Yeah. It'll be great. Yow. Uh, you can also email us your feedback at mortalrealms at gmail dot com. You can find our Patreon oh, at. Let Patreon. me pause real quick about the email. Um, yeah, there are a couple of listeners that you sent some emails in. I got them. I read them. I, we are going to talk about them. It's just not going to be on this episode. So I don't want you to hear this and be like, "What the f?" I sent an email and nobody even referenced it. It's coming. Dear listeners, got you. so don't don't you fret. Carry on. I, I, I thought the show was what the heck, not what the f. <laughs> <laughs> oh, got him. They're still making shows. Um, I'm just kidding. I know they. Are. I'm just okay, Dave. I'm just joking. Awesome. <laughs> 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 no, a little too many, honestly. Uh, Dial Jeez, that, come on, guys. Look bad. Just twisting a half of ass's knife in there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are you saying it's a king killer? Are you saying that Davy is the king? I mean, that is a pretty veiled threat, right there, sir. That's all I'm gonna say. Uh, I don't know. What I don't I'm think saying. he wears a lot of veils. I don't know. Because he that's killed royalty, and that's how he got the curse. Like I'm, I'm, not, I'm bringing the Lord to the in joke. Get it? Yeah, not, um, not Usharan. That's for you're sure. explaining the joke. We were going to get there. There was going to be a that's callback kind of later. Be the great. joke is dead. You you would but underestimate like this, my. It's like this army. Let's go. Yeah, no, <laughs> hey, that's how it's done. That's why he's here making the money. <laughs> Listen to party at the L points for more fun things. <laughs> Um, you can also find our Patreon at patreon.com slash the mortal realms to support the show, get early releases of the story phase and access exclusive content like the pocket realms, which are short story phases hosted by Davy and Aaron and Warhammer bros, which is Paven's attempt to get his brother into 40 K. And if you can't or don't want to pitch in monetarily, then head on over to your podcast service of choice and give us a review or, you know, just go ahead and tell a friend about the mortal realms. Uh, just as an aside, it is so weird hearing every, someone else do this, first of all. And second of all, is that what I sound like? Oh, my God. I am. No, I'm it apparently. <laughs> no, no. There's a lot I'm more just, go, like wandering just, when you do it, Aaron. It's good. It's you, good. You can, it's it's so much more breathy, too. <laughs> so He's really right. taking it on sure. and like making it his own. Mm, I love Whereas that. You're, yeah. you're just like rat-a-tat-tat-tat-tat. We are doing this. We are doing this now. See, I'm just always out of breath and, is the issue. And, and Will is just like, I'm here. I have entered the room. We're doing it. Soothing, yeah. You can't, can't avoid it. It's coming for and you. And final note before we get into it. Uh, thank you to Games Workshop for giving us a review copy of the various books. <laughs> and there are a there lot are of multiple. Them. There are the very many. The mountain of books. Yeah. All right. I feel like now we're entering the story phase. Can you In the story him? phase. We delve into the stories, characters, creatures, and environments of the the, the world of legend. Is wait, that a term? Wait. I've never heard that phrase before. I, I mean, it's not the nine realms. It's all I know. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's like done. it's like one realm. Is that what this is? That's not nearly enough. I think it's just one plane. One plane. Mm-hmm. It's all flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, like globe? The are. I don't want to get into this, but like, are you a is flat it, earther? Is that what I'm hearing right now? Is it a, a flat is it a globe earther? Though? I mean, I don't know the first thing about. We got poles. If we got poles, it's got to be a globe. Who says we have poles? We just have up and down. It's literally in the narrative that they have poles. I am northern. I am the the old world flat earther. I'm the old world flat. Wow, you heard it here first, folks. Tristan is the old world flat earther, and that is all there is to it. Man, we got the old world. We got the Southlands. We got Lustria. We got poles. Like, what is going on here? We don't have any poles. I thought it was Kislev. (laughs) 
Boom. Yeah. There you go. All right. So, yeah, we're going to talk about the Tomb Kings of Khemri. Uh, this is going to be a little bit different than our standard like battle tome episodes because we're pulling together information from the rule book, the Arcane Journal, and a little bit of stuff from the Ravening Hordes book to make sure that anyone hopping into the old world kind of gets the best overview of the lore. And Tristan also has a pile of books with other lore as well i only have one battle tome i gotta step my game up those are rookie it's numbers just, aaron it's just every white dwarf that's ever been made for that has any tomb king's reference in it and tyler mengel's um age of sigmar uh nice oh yeah, yeah. i forgot about that that's good yep. go. yeah it's gonna hurt coffee <laughs> sure. so in case you've been living underneath a rock that is the hero rock that makes for awesome poses for miniatures. We're going to be talking about the release of The Old World, which is the new game released by the Specialist Studios for Games Workshop. So if you're listening to The Mortal Realms going, hey, where's The Mortal Realms? We're talking about The Old World right now. It's going to be releasing very soon. And we're talking specifically about the Tomb Kings, which literally don't exist in Age of Sigmar. So you're not Except crazy. You're not wrong. In The Old World, the Tomb Kings exist. And that's where we're going down to desert town south south down that makes sense yeah i see it <laughs> um so since we're talking about the tomb kings i want to figure out who this race is generally and that includes everyone giving me their best one sentence description aaron i'm going to start with you it's no longer my favorite segment <laughs> um, again is this what i've been doing to people i warned yes. you i warned you i said he's gonna ask you the questions this yeah episode. i knew it you're not running even it. before you wrote it i had a feeling this was this was coming for me I, my day my comeuppance was on its on its way um all right so if i have to get you're, you're so okay explain i have to give a one sentence summary of the faction that's impossible how could you sum up a faction in one sentence um but i'll do my best i'll do my uh darndest um okay so the tomb kings mm -hmm. are a race of undead uh once great civilization i'm mean, gonna once and future great civilization of undead uh warriors um led by a strong and powerful and charismatic uh uh leader um from the deserts of camry hekara um to uh one day uh take conquer the world um and uh, subjugate it under his rule this isn't fun. Yeah. It's not fun for the person doing it, I realize. <laughs> I'm not enjoying next. this at all. Be next. Okay. Oh, do you want to go next? Yes. So these are the immortal residents of the Mortis Delta that are living in denial of their death. Boom. <laughs> okay. See, nice and snappy. How do I right. mute him? How do I mute him? Is that is that an option? It's no, for, not for myself and also the episode, actually. I'm not I'm not used to not being in control. <laughs> it's weird. I do not care for this whole dynamic at all. I regret it it's immediately. Um, oh, I guess yeah. it's my turn. Is it my turn? Yeah. Oh, boy. Go for it, Tristan. All right. I have one run on sentence to explain them. Um, the true monarchs are of the undead, the first and the greatest civilization to ever rise, fall, and rise again. The real kings of the desert, mountains, and rightful rulers of all places that they can see the greatest sculptors in time of legends and the will of their gods made manifest or as robin credits once said are army of skeletons and statues <laughs> wow <laughs> like he actually prepared i mean come on which is against the spirit of yeah. the game it's okay because he's against it so i won't give him a hard <laughs> time for suck. it he's done the, on the recording anyways but where was the fun i mean yeah. honestly referencing robin credits I, I appreciate but there's no pun i mean come on I don't, who is that i don't know who that is yeah i don't know who that is <laughs> It's fine. It's just the guy that wrote you the book. You see what I deal with, Tristan? Yeah. You see what I deal with? I'm like, come on, Dervish for Dales? Nobody gets that. Come on. Here we, here we go. There's there's the fine. pun. It's, fine. So it's, a, it's a great fine. medium for puns when they're visual. <laughs> he put a safety mask on. He put a, put a mask uh, on that, everyone. You guys, don't, you guys don't release your video to the public? You mean no. my Ushabdi <laughs> mask that I take to tournaments isn't going to be seen by everyone? Uh, no, we just do it. I don't even think it's being recorded. Right? That's just You're revoking tournaments. as a, a, a dog skull. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Yeah. Take his way. All is, that great. is that technically a dollar because he danced the song? Or does he actually have to sing the song? I just have to sing the song. This is the rules of the game. I've listened to every single episode. I know the rules of this game. <laughs> you know, I know how to get around them. Let's go. <laughs> By the way, yeah. back to my Dead Man's Party quote, the, the the Thorn for Every Heart cover of that on the Punko Zadie album is uh, really good. And I was listening to it a lot over and over again before we got on this episode. I won't sing it, but it's 
pretty tasty. Anyways, carry on. Speaking yeah. of callbacks to the pun, how did nobody do a weekend at Bernie's? Because, I mean, literally, we're just hauling a dead guy around in a chariot all over the That's whole right. world. It just makes sense uh, in yeah. all head. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to go into the history of the race. Uh, kind of starting off with what's in the core rule book. What happened to the Tomb Kings before they were put into the tombs? How did they become kings? Ooh, well, they're always kings in our hearts, right? Oh, mm-hmm. always now and forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, which which generation of lore do you want? Do you want the current or do you want the, <laughs> so, the first or do you want the eighth? Or what do you want? I can same. give you every single one you want, baby. <laughs> what? Because it's changed. It mm-hmm. has. Uh, we go with the most recent, which is the oldest world, which is the newest book. I, that I, my sense. head just exploded. I don't understand right. what you're saying. Uh, but is this an unreliable narrator situation whenever the original texts are actually the more accurate and then the current ones are actually the most blasphemous? Mm-hmm. I said mm-hmm. the word wrong. Let's go. Blasphemous. It's okay. <laughs> You're really good. All right. Um, so do you want me to go off? I can go off if you, if you, unless you do want it. to go. I want to hear it. I'll go. Okay, cool. Um, let's proceed to my notes. All right. It's fun like that, right? <laughs> um, but no, I'll just do it off the dome. So the um, deserts of uh, Nehekara first never had that name. They were first, just like everywhere else, a nameless plain wherever people would go. The Great River Vitae never had that name yet. It was actually just a collection of tribes and just like all over the rest of the not mortal realms, the old world. Yeah. I don't know. I a leader used rose to up. It that. Yeah. A leader, a leader rose up by the name of Nehek, who created the very first city, which was, um, what was it? Zandri. Um, found it. Wait, no, it wasn't Zandri. Uh-oh. Uh, my, my notes are terrible. What am I doing here? While you're looking okay, up, so. is Zandri Dust still called Zandri Dust, or is it not called that anymore? It is, okay. it is still called okay. Zandri Dust, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cool. Anyways, so, um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Nehekara was officially given its name. The first city was made um and it was made by the great king nehek who was the first one in recorded history they didn't even have language or words yet but they had their civilization started then came more kings and then the first one who had any type of words with it was uh kesek who made numas and then also um then there was zakesh who made zandri so all the different cities started rising up and at this point in time it was the very first civilization in the world that was ever recorded so by by the time that we get to closer to more modern times, like 2000 years, even before the current timeline, um, the great civilizations rose up. City states were happening. There were um, Camry was being in was being made. Camry is a really interesting city because it's either, as the current timeline says, the oldest city and the greatest and the grandest one. Or mm-hmm. it's the newest city that was started by Setra, who mm-hmm. is the all time greatest ruler of all time of all time. Of all time. Of the of all, all of the uh, times, and he yeah. started the city of Camry as kind of a um, shout out to the city of Amarna. That was a, a real city that was made in Egypt. Um, but I think they retconned that to get rid of that reference to Egypt. Mm-hmm. Um, because Prince Akhenaten or King Akhenaten started that whenever he was king. Kind of like how Setra, after he became king, mm-hmm. um, made his own city. But they got rid of that. So we don't have to talk about that. Sure. So basically desert um it was like where the cradle civilization came from almost everywhere else was being like slowly populated by humans but this is where civilization truly became it's the first languages the first art the first war was started in hekara it is the most ancient civilization in the entire world yep yeah the one of the cool things i saw from the like the book is that it's the first true human empire Mm -hmm. um and I just really like that idea because everyone sees the tomb kings like, oh yeah, they're old, but uh, surely this the main human faction is the first human faction. No, mm-hmm. not even close. So, no, maybe a little bit. Listener, I hear you saying, wait, in the mortal realms, like they'd be like, hey, we're gonna take this idea and then we're gonna like twist it ninety degrees, and they're like that's gonna be the cool thing about this race. So if you've never heard old world lore before. Yes, this is fantasy Egypt, 100%. Like Tristan was saying, yeah, we kind of changed this because it was straight up exactly that, right? Um, So this is kind of an artifact of where Games Workshop came from and where it exists. I kind of implied that to begin with. We're like, hey, it's the... 
the World's Edge Mountains. Actually, they're the Derbyshire Dales. A lot of where this comes from is a bunch of people just thinking, hey, it'd be kind of fun to make up a world. We're going to be a little bit Tolkien. We're going to be a little bit English. We're going to be a little bit fantasy, right? And so what we have here is we have kind of a, a reimagining, as Tristan was saying, we have these different eras of where the Tomb Kings are and what their history is. And we're starting this over again. So the old world, you might think, as somebody who's never been exposed to it before, saying, oh, well, we're just continuing on the storyline that we had from when Warhammer Fantasy Battles came, right? Oh, no. What actually is happening is we're going back before the storyline started with the main game way back in the day. And we're going to a, you know, Three Kingdoms War, if you can understand that reference, right? We're coming back to a place before the history that was written. Oh, come on. There's a video game. It was called The War of Three Kingdoms. It was like super <laughs> popular when I was a kid. Uh, but anyway, so a lot of the factions, a lot of the things that you're going to hear us talk about have a lot of similarities with a very specific 80s, 90s British humor to them. Which to a lot of us in the modern day is going to be like, there might have been some things that were interesting that I probably wouldn't talk about anymore. You're right. That's why we're getting a revised history. There might have been some things that we go, wait, why are we just plagiarizing Egypt? We're not actually plagiarizing Egypt. We're trying to like make a new history for something that was created in the 80s and 90s in Britain when they said, who cares about this? We don't have this understanding that we have now. So um, I'm not apologizing for what's going on. I'm attempting to explain to you if you've never heard before, like that's kind of where we are right now. And the Tomb Kings are what grew out of that. And when the Tomb Kings were in Aeth, they had all this like super cool, interesting lore that had completely diverted from where we were when we started with Tomb Kings. When we started with, oh, it's fantasy Egypt. But we're going back before that timeline and kind of recreating that background. So we're going to kind of, you know, recreate everything that's happening right now. Um, so that's where we're kind of starting from. And now that you know that, we don't kind of have to reference that history anymore. And we can just kind of enjoy what's going on. But if you've never heard of the old world before, it might have been a bit confusing. And no, you're not wrong. So what you're saying is that we're not plagiarizing Egypt, but rather Egypt is plagiarizing the Tomb Kings, I think. Is the oh, 100% at this point. That's like, what I heard yeah. I've been yeah. oh, for 50 years. <laughs> I <like it. laughs> oh, I love that. Tristan is literally covering his face, which makes for great radio. Uh, <laughs> but oh, yeah, so we get some super fun things going on here. Um, I, I, I think it's wonderful that they actually, this is something that they're doing now that they had not done in the past. And they're like, hey, we're going to assume you know nothing. Yeah. And assuming mm -hmm. you know nothing, we're going to build from there. We never got this history in Warhammer Fantasy Battles because it was so much off the cuff of like, oh, this place exists. There's this war that's been going on for 50 years. We're going to give you a two paragraph explanation and then move from there. Right. We're yeah. actually getting where did this race come from? Like, really? What was the first city that was built? We're getting a lot more exploration and we're getting an actual setting for a game instead of we're going to build some miniatures and then create a setting around the miniatures that we've been making for a while. One of the cool things that GW does is when they sculpt new miniatures, for example, the Bretonian Knights on foot, for example, the Bone Dragon that comes with Two Kings. The rules writers actually go and talk to the sculptor and say, hey, you made a cool miniature. What do you want me to understand about this miniature? And how does that translate into where Tomb Kings are going? And we're getting some of that now. And we're getting that from the very beginning. So I talked for a long time, so I'm going to shut up now. Outline be damned. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, As I will just throw caveats in there. Um, because some of the things that Tristan mentioned of like the first cities and cool things like that are from the older books. There is the things that came out in these books are very not super in depth. Like, yes, it's assuming, you know, nothing. So it's a good primer, mm -hmm. but it doesn't go yeah. as in depth as some of the older information that people can find. Sure. On the session. 
no, that's a great point. Like you, you're able to go back and you can check out these ancestral texts, as I like to call them, or just yeah. hit up any kind of like wiki because like they'll yeah. have a lot of the answers too. But I think it's a, as Paul just said, it's a great jumping in point because it really explains that. Yes, this was like the first civilization, the first empire that rose up. It ended up conquering almost all of the map that is um, in the old world. Like that, that's one of the big things is that they were the first massive empire to rise up and to fall. Mm -hmm. Um, The and I think one of the great things to point out would be how they fell why they became how who they are like sure they were this great civilization but what led them to where they are now um in the story hey tristan i Uh, bet that we're not going to hear anybody that we know from age of sigmar when we talk about that are we no probably not definitely (laughs) definitely not so no bums no bums yeah uh, distant both in time and in space there's no way there'd be any connection to the mortal realms whatsoever Gosh, no. Um, well, uh, anyways, anyways. <laughs> well, uh, so as a as like we were saying, like this empire rose up was huge. Um, it was a whole bunch of different city states. Like there's lots of different places all around this desert that has these uh, rivers flowing right through it, just like the Nile. Um, there's a few different ones, though. And so like all these different city states have popped up in the little spots where like life is ever was flourishing, where all the oases are in this grand desert. Um and this is all happening while every other civilized, every, every other civilization of man is completely in the tribal stage. Mm-hmm. Living in uh, huts and stuff. Yeah. And as, you know, as city states love to do, they ended up getting kind of distracted after expanding for so long. Then they decided to turn their eyes more inwards. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden the time of strife, as uh, we'll call it, strife in the great land, as they call it in the rule book. Um happens and they start doing a lot more infighting so city states are attacking each other they're raiding other parts of cities like other cities are rising up and falling like all of a sudden it just becomes a land of war and with that a great conqueror emerges setra the imperishable as he is known or the king of kings uh as he's known in his lifetime what else is he known or known as in that he's got like a million titles. I was, I was hoping you knew a couple off the top of your head. <laughs> oh, you mean? I was going to say you give me three, give me three seconds, and I'll be able to okay. get it because it's on the tip of my tongue, and I used to be able to do this from the rip. There's, there's speaking countless. of the rip, Will, what do you got? <laughs> I was going to say, you mean, O mighty Cetra, great king of the Hekara, the imperishable Kembrakara, king of kings, opener of the way, wielder of the divine flame, punisher of nomads, the great unifier, commander of the golden legion, sacred of appearance, bringer of light, father of hawks, builder of <laughs> cities, protector of the two worlds, keeper of the hours, chosen of Tra, didn't pronounce that Petra. right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, high steward of the horizon, sailor of the great Vitae, sentinel of the two realms, the undisputed, begetter of the begat, scourge of the faithless, carrion feeder, first of the charnel valley, rider of the sacred chariot, mighty lion of the infinite desert, lord of the shifting sands, he who holds the scepter, great hawk of the heavens, waker of the hierotitan, monarch of the sky, king of the shifting sands, champion of the gods, Hamilcar, and many, many more. Oh, you mean that, Cetra? Okay, okay, now I understand. Yeah, I understand that guy, which one you're talking about. Guy, yeah, the golden, yeah. the golden hawk of the desert. Um, <laughs> he he rises up and he unifies all of um, all of Nehekara. He conquers the entire place, which is ridiculous if you think about it, because it means that he's conquering basically whole empires of onto himself. Um, the the Uh, arcane journal actually goes into specifics as to why he was so successful in doing this it's pretty cool i really enjoy it Uh, but setra rises up conquers everything expands even more northern and more southern into the world uh conquers all of what britonia is all like even goes up into the more northern wastes of like the world um and as he does that he's slowly aging And as he's slowly aging in his victories, he's just getting older and older and older. And you know what? As uh, LeBron James likes to say, father time is undefeated. Um, (laughs) But he is holding it off as long as possible. And he becomes obsessed with death and the idea of extending his life. So he gets his priests to create 
the mortuary cult. He is the very first priest king of Kemri. He is the person who says, we have to solve this problem, which is me dying. All the rest of you don't care. Me dying, that's our main issue. So he puts everything in his society directing towards this. Death becomes the number one thing that they worship. Because just like in Egypt, there were tons of different gods. But in the time of Setra, Usheron, uh, not Usheron, uh, whoa, my brain it's is... Like- <laughs> uh, He's Usheron, though. Oh, Usheron, you. Know. you. Uh, oh, oh, no, it's in the old world. world. <laughs> that wasn't completely wrong, but, you know, it's a little bit off. Oh, no, but uh, we can go off about Usheron later and how he's a punk. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, gosh, in the old world he is. Um, oh, God. Okay, but the God of Death. Oh, this is this is driving me crazy, and I'm going to get Iris. absolutely made fun of for this. Yeah, Iris. Um, thanks, Tyler. Ooh, I wish you were here. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, so he is the God of Death, and all of a sudden he becomes the most venerated, the most powerful God in Nakara during this time. So like that's where all the skull motifs start popping off from. That's why all of a sudden there's all these like you start to see all these different images of like the scarab. Everything that represents death becomes what is most important in society. And Setra puts in motion the mortuary cult, which ends up being his undoing. But how? But what? How, Sway? Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> with the mortuary cult, um, Setra, they figure out ways to extend life, to extend Setra's life, to push him further and further, much further than anyone has any right to be, like, way beyond what a mortal should have done but unfortunately Cetra's battle with father time goes just same way as lebron james undefeated um he does slowly succumb he is pissed off he is mad i think he ends up killing his entire family um as a way to be like are you sure just take them instead <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, he takes his bodyguard with him too. Tracy's, like, yeah, oh he yeah, ends up takes <laughs> body. So, so he ends up getting put to rest inside of the greatest structure that's ever been erected in the world, the Great Pyramid of Setra. It is this He's glimmering no, white. Sorry. Pi- get out of here. Um, um, it is a glimmering white uh, monolith that's in the desert. It's the biggest structure that's ever been made in the world, and it is honestly just a complete sight to behold. And inside mm. of that alive gets buried his entire legion of troops his heralds his like anyone that was anything to him gets buried alive with him like Mm -hmm. his like anything they Mm -hmm. all get entombed within this and he is sealed shut and from there the mortuary cult takes off Mm -hmm. off the leash a little bit if you think a priestly power goes off whenever a guy's alive oh no it just keeps rolling and rolling and rolling they start becoming the most powerful thing in the nation other than the kings themselves right and debatably yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. on paper I know I spent like 10 minutes dissing this is fantasy Egypt, right? But this was legitimately one of my favorite stories in the old world. It's so fun and cool, yeah. right? Because yeah, weird definition of the word fun, but okay. This is what the old world does, right? It's like I recognize you because you're fantasy Egypt, right? But then we go full fantasy and we say, all right, maybe you believe this and this didn't happen that we know over and understand or blah, 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 right? It's respecting everybody's religious beliefs. But this is the awesome thing where we get to the mortuary cult. We bury everybody, but then all of a sudden we're going to have something different, right? We're going to have what we know is the tomb Kings, not to be something that is buried, but something that is risen. Right. And this is where the super fun narrative. And this is where Nagash's story, like of betrayal of sorry, evil, oh. right? Like, this is where it starts to, like, actually be interesting and starts to move forward and becomes this, like, literal, like, extra-worldly threat to literally everything, right? So one of the things that we have is we had the River Vitae, right? We're going to end up subverting that, and we're going to end up subverting a lot of expectations as we go forward. So it's super fun and engaging to me. Mm Mm-hmm. And so Nagash, as you just said, is from Nehekara. Oh, what? What? Ba, ba, ba. <laughs> so he was he was a oh, god no. of Nehekara. No, not even. What? He was uh, he was Literally the a punk. 
he he was he was the second son of a king so he was destined to be in the priesthood his brother was going to be the going to be the actual king he was going to just be his head priest nagash didn't like that so nagash ends up like completely dedicating himself to priesthood but dun 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 he kills the whole of his family and he's amassed enough power through the priesthood to go on to the throne of Nehekara to go on to the throne of Kemri and to take over everything. Um, the full megalomania kicks in. He gains um, all of the power. He takes over, like, this is a few, like, I think two or three hundred years after Setra, maybe five hundred. Um, uh, so he passes 500 away. after he started, yeah. Yeah. So, um, like, long dead. And so Nagash takes over and it goes, oh boy, it does not go great. Um, he goes full insane. After murdering his family, he um, starts to, like, put a tithe out and demand that all of the different cities pay him tons of money so he can make his own Great Pyramid even bigger than Setra which up until this point was the biggest structure everyone still 500 years later was terrified of Setra. they didn't want his ghost to be pissed off at them even for a minute so all the other structures that have been built because things have been rolling since then with the mortuary cult um every priest every king has had their own little structure built or massive gigantic pyramid um city whatever um but they've always been just a little bit smaller than Setra's because they didn't want to piss them off not Nagash. Nagash firmly believed that he was more important than Setra and built his own gigantic black pyramid from imported stone from I don't remember where. Um, and Fun bit about Madison, Wisconsin, which in which many of us live, but um, the buildings here around the state capitol are not allowed to be taller than the state capitol. So if you look at our skyline, like legally, every, I'll say skyscraper in quotes, is like just a smidge shorter than the actual capital itself because it's so cool um also our state capital is like five feet taller than every other capital that's a state I, yeah <laughs> because yeah. they're like hey we're the coolest so welcome yeah, we wisconsin are. we're um we're not so one quick thing with pei where i'm from sure. um for the longest time you weren't allowed to build higher than three stories because they were worried that the buildings would fall into the earth because we're on top of a, basically a sand dune <laughs> yeah and so yep. you weren't allowed to be taller than the church <laughs> okay oh, <laughs> basically wow. the same thing. um <laughs> and you and like people have gotten special building permits to try to build bigger buildings on PEI than that over the years. And several of them have been, have actually been too big and have sunk into the ground. Oh, they're like, well, so no, they end up being short, eventually they'll be shorter than the church one day. Is time on. For the most part, they just get <laughs> torn down. Yeah. But yeah, so that's, that's my short King joke. Yeah. <laughs> I want a quick nuance, something that uh, Tristan said with a little bit of extra old world lore, if you've not heard the old world before, um, so magic is something that is cool and interesting in the old world because it's not native like it is in the mortal realms. It's something that really has to be taught and understood. Uh, whereas in the mortal realms, you can literally have somebody that's like, hey, oh, all of a sudden I've decided I can make fire. Hey, I can make fire out of my fist because it's cool because magic is like super present and enervating into everything and every one, right? You go to the realm of fire, you're going to know that fire magic exists because somebody's going to be using it. Somebody's going to be harnessing it for a device. In the old world, it doesn't work that way. Magic is something that exists, but the vast majority, in fact, like pretty much everything that we know of magic, comes from this race called the Old Ones. And the Old Ones taught magic to the Slan, and then the Slan taught magic to the High Elves and... They taught magic to the humans and there's all these like kind of nuances and and they taught runes to the dwarves because they're not magic. Nagash is something separate. Nagash is something new, right? Because Nagash didn't say, let me learn something from you. Nagash said, I will take something from you. So this whole idea that I'm going to defeat death, right? One would say... If you were from, say, a mortal realm's perspective, I'm going to take the amethyst wind and I'm going to become a master of that, right? In the previous old world lore, which, to be honest, I haven't found the connection at this point, um, he captured some dark elves 
and tortured them to death. And then he all of a sudden understood, hey, there is this actual death magic. Like, he is such a anti-hero that he created his own magic. Necromancy wasn't something that was super widespread. Um, it wasn't something that was super noticeable, especially not in Nakara, right? But he was just like, I am so obsessed with this goal. I'm going to figure this out. Nobody really taught him anything about this death magic, anything about raising the dead, right? But he's like, but this is my goal. This is who I am. I am such a megalomaniac that I'm going to learn how to use magic in a way that nobody has told me and I have not learned from before. I appreciate your use of the word anti-hero to tell me where your morals are. Yeah. So thank you for that. Instead of <laughs> you're psychopath welcome. You're villain welcome. dude, <laughs> you're don't, don't anti-hero. And I, everyone else on the call was like, excuse me? Ooh. It's all about distinctions. It's all about nuance. We're just uh, pointing out here. Okay, I had to look up the dark elf thing that that you mentioned, and apparently that checks out. Okay, I, I, I had to I just... Check your sources there, but that apparently yeah. is a real thing. Um, Check your sources. Might not be in this run, but uh, it's a thing that's yeah. been, it's been a rumor. At least somebody okay. said it once. Uh, I bet it was Robin Credis. Probably Robin Credis. Do you think <laughs> it, is it referenced in this book at all? Because they don't want to talk about Dark Elves because they're not nope. in the game. I wonder. Okay. I wonder um, if one, nope. they would ever bring it up. Anyway. It I was looking for it. Yeah. Right. Um, Car- carry on. For the most part, they were just like, Nagash, he's a bad dude. Yeah. And so... Um, he rises up to power. Everybody hates him. Yeah. He decides that he needs to like tax every world. Everybody hates the tax man. Sure. Um, Plus, regicide include, is a big deal with these guys, right? Because they're, they're such a um, exactly monarchical uh, adjective form of monarchy. Um, monarchical. monarchical? No, that's weird. Uh, that's not a word. Anyways, it's but true, they're so totally into kings. True, it is a word. Um, yeah, so then we start killing kings. Like society <laughs> is like nope. We as it cumulatively do not care for that action, my friend. Um, so anyways, carry on. <laughs> um, and so uh so he rises up, uh, he takes over, everybody hates him, everyone just kinda and so for the most part, everybody gets subjugated for quite a few years, and then after a bit, everyone's like, you know what? I hate you. <laughs> so was Nagash alive at this point? Nagash was alive at this point. This is human Nagash. This is Nagash like hanging out, having his dork dorky haircuts, like he's going through his like top knot phase. Like he's got he's just like complete dorkdom. He's eating lunch alone because no one likes him. You know, he's got like the the weird emo phase and he's got like the oh my grandfather died phase. You know, it's terrible. He cause he killed him, because he killed his grandfather. <laughs> He okay. He is the most punchable face still, mm. even all the way into Age of Sigmar. But this yeah. is the beginning of the punchable face. For sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So he he rises up. Um, everyone hates him. He ends up getting um, usurped and gets tossed and run out um, of Nehekara. There becomes like a great grouping of seven kings that rise up and say, listen here, buddy, you need to get out. Uh, And they with the mortuary cult who end up turning against the gash because they were like, you suck. And they're probably Mm -hmm. like, you're making us look bad, too. Like, I mean, by no means are they good dudes necessarily. But the fact that like they can kind of fly (laughs) under the radar and not and not make everybody else hate them is like a a goal for them. Um, And so then when he really paints the target on their back, they're like, oh, this isn't what we signed up for. We're not with him. Yeah. <laughs> He's, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> um, so the seven kings rise up. The mortuary cult rises up with them. This is whenever the first constructs start being imbued with the souls of heroes. So kind of like Stormcast for all of our Age of Sigmar ah, friends. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, hold on. Hold on. We don't on. Have to, you know, they, they, all of these huge statues get imbued with the souls of the great heroes of Nehekara, um, of Khemri, of any other city-state, Qatar. Um, and they march and they take the Black Pyramid. They they take Nagash. They ended up just killing, getting rid of all of his, all of his uh, underlings. But they don't find him. No. Wow. Weird. 
Isn't no, that weird? Cash. He is like unable they, to be found. They totally did. And like, that's where the storyline ends. Boom. Done. Because, that would be yeah. so nice. All done. <laughs> that everybody lives happily ever after. Uh, so, yeah, they don't find him. He is missing. He's MIA because he's a gigantic coward. Still is. Um, Whoa. Throw in some shade. It's not that hard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's not tall. And I don't um, think no so, oil. Yeah, so he basically absconds, runs away, tries to find a place, ends up becoming a gigantic hermit, finds a place called Cripple Peak. This Cripple Peak place, he, he finds what is called Warp Stone. For all of our mm-hmm. Skaven lovers in the chat, that is what makes things go absolutely bonkers. Um, anybody want to fill me in on what a Warp Stone is? So I'm going to gonna quick fill you in on this because, Thank again, you. this is a divergence from the Mortal Realms. Warpstone is a unique thing in the old world. Warpstone is coalesced chaos, right? So the power of chaos, but as a rock. There is in no other form. special rocks in the old world. There's right? no fire rock? We don't have aquathrite, right? We don't have all these other solidified winds of magic like we do in Age of Sigmar. We just have Warpstone. Right. Mm. And Warpstone is the thing that the Skaven use. But wait a minute. Wait, what? You're saying that we have somebody who is a lone bull, like, say, LeBron James, taking part and using this Warpstone instead of like the rest of the world who looks at magic and is like, all right, I'm Larry Bird. I need my whole team around me. I need eight circles of magic in order to make everything make sense. We're saying LeBron James plays. You don't know. I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm trying to connect with you. I'm trying to understand that you and give you some. I, it doesn't sound right, but I don't know enough enough about it to refute. We're gonna say exactly. Kyrie Irving. Let's say right. Kyrie Irving. Here we go. Let's go with Kyrie Irving. <laughs> it works I was really waiting well. Waiting to fill in and make me sound smart, Tristan, and then you just made fun of me. I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to bring you in. So wrong. I'm this trying is, to meet you where you're at. Yeah. <laughs> you're so wrong. I'm allowing you to enjoy this moment and to tell me that I'm wrong because, you know, Aaron and Will never do. They just kind of move on. So, you know, it is what it is. Because if, if I start something, it just makes it longer. Yeah. So Kyrie Irving finds a big rock and then what happens? And then he goes, hey, look at all this power that I can take from this stone that is obviously not affiliated with chaos whatsoever and is obviously not going to taint me whatsoever at all, right? Because look at me, I am so cool that I learned my own school of magic that nobody else knows because, you know, I'm super cool and I'm Nagash. Better write it down. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, say, you know, it's weird. If I were to write something down and if I were to say Nagash, I'd be like, hey, am I going to write it down on the papyrus? I uh, know. I, I don't mm-hmm. think I'm going to write it down on papyrus. Am I going to write it down Not on cool say, enough. a plaque like the, you know, the lizard men yeah. do yeah. when yeah. they mm-hmm. solidify mm-hmm. their thought into hard. words? No, no, that's, 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 that's too like firm. Like I could bludgeon Steel? somebody with that. No, like a, I don't think I'm going to do that. Rock? No, not could cuneiform. You go grosser? Like, could you could you make it grosser? I think I feel like that's maybe the direction you want to go. No, I, I feel like I grosser? could make books, but I could make them out of the flesh of people. There you go, super gross. If, yeah, I think you got it. All right. I, I think I think that's what I would do if I was in the gash. What do you think, Justin? Do you think that's what I would do? I feel like I would do something else. I think I think I'd do something else. <laughs> Me, Aaron, would do something different. Yeah, but the gash is built different. Yeah, damn right. Built <laughs> or tough. Um, <laughs> so he's, he's a shabby driver. He found uh, Warpstone. He's in a place called Cripple Peak. Why would you hang out in a place called Cripple Peak? That doesn't seem like the, the most appealing uh, destination. Nobody else wants to go there. Oh. Nobody else likes you, and nobody else will come find you. Yeah, it's true. If you're the no. if you're the biggest herb, you'll be like, oh, sick. It's <laughs> it's kind of like Foggy Bottom. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's running experiments. Is it here? Is it here where he starts making skellies? Is like, is this w- where we make the transition? Um, yeah. 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 Okay. So here's, he did here's it. where he starts. He starts raising the undead. He starts having cults of people also living with their oh yeah like, true. ancestors. This is whenever the full cult of Nagash kicks up and people are just like, this guy's crazy. <laughs> Yo, great uncle Dave, this guy's crazy. And great uncle Dave with his one arm goes totally. 
and then let's join his weird Appalachian militia. I'm sorry for yeah. anybody, any of our <laughs> listeners who are in an Appalachian militia. Um, goodbye, yeah. Kentucky. Goodbye, Tennessee. I apologize. Yes. Do we have to be cool towards Appalachian militias? I just, I suppose I don't know. Um, I'll <laughs> think about that uh, later. Uh, but as someone who lives incredibly far away from the Appalachian Mountains, <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, sure. I'm not as so, far. Um, yeah, so like, Gash basically raises an army. He starts like going off. Um, in the meantime, he uh, starts tainting different people with his elixir of life, where he tries mm-hmm. to like experiment, try to f- like. He basically uses people as guinea pigs. Those people ended up turning vampires. Weird. Whoa. Why get an aversion to light? Um, all of a sudden. There's uh, one specific city in um, Nehekara called Lamia that um, the leader just, you know, thought thought they'd get a cool milkshake one day or something. And a whole bunch of them start becoming vampires, aversion to sunlight, um, you know, superpowers. Who cares? I bet, uh, I bet Lamia has no, that much. Yeah, I bet Lamia has no connection to new Lamia in the Mortal oh, Realms. I bet there's not, no connection not, whatsoever. Not. Real coincidence. That's, that's yeah. not why they wear the same hats. Um, Spoilers. Totally a connection, right? Like, oh, that's what we're getting here. Not, come we're on. getting into get Neparata. Um, so this is where I think, I, I, this is going to be a side again, this is where I think the lore of the old world becomes super cool, right? We're like, we're going to say that we're going to have ancient Egypt, and we're going to say that ancient Egypt, their beliefs are real, and when their beliefs become real, all of a sudden, we're going to tie it into Eastern European mythology. And we're going to yeah. say, no, vampires exist. You know who created them? The guy who was super afraid of death. And you know who that guy is? He lives in a place called Cripple Peak. Not because he is a cripple, but because he cripples other people. He is the peak of crippling the human race. Bam. Moving on. Wow, got there. Um, yeah, this is the part where things get supernatural up in here. Mm-hmm. Um and so, and this is the point whenever Nagash marches down to Nehekara and is like, listen, I came back for my stuff. <laughs> and so <laughs> he is just absolutely like slamming, trying to take over. But you know what? Nehekara is like, mm, no. And they get together. They push back Nagash and tell him to go back to where he came from. They beat back the undead hordes. They come together as a nation and under the great new leader who has a leader has, who hasn't seen um, as like since Setra named Al Al Kaladazar. And mm. he is such a G. I love this dude. He's one of my all time favorite heroes yeah. in in uh, in Warhammer. Um, so he gets everyone together. He is known as like in being incredibly charismatic, kind, everything that Setra wasn't and never wanted to be. But he is like he is the coolest dude. And. He gets everybody together, get, tells Nagash to get bent, and then he gets pushed back. Nagash is so upset. He is so mad. He is just like so butthurt um, that he ends up, po- he poisons the great river Vitae. The 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 giver of life, the cradle of civilization was created from the way this river flowed. It's where people came to gather. It's where civilization itself, the first empire, truly rose up. He was like, nah, screw that place. Basically poisons it. Poisons it with like a soul curse level of absolute, like chaotic, uh, undeath energy. And slowly but surely, Nehekara starts to die. Up nine out of millions nine out of ten people die al Al Desire has to sit on his throne and watch his people slowly wither plagues happen like just people are just dying left right and center and it only takes about 10 years for nehekara to become to go from the greatest civilization ever to being a husk of itself and that's when nagash returns Still pretty great dun, dun, dun. though, even even in Hus, still great. I think. Yeah, it's still pretty cool. Um, and it's like it's like insult to injury that that um your guy whose name I can't pronounce Alka Halazavazara. Um, that he he survives it all right, and he has to watch yeah. it, and like so he's hardy mm-hmm. in hail while he watches the civilization drop, which almost makes him cooler because like oh he also he's got he's got tragedy in his life too, which exactly ties with the guy. Mm-hmm. Well, so one of the other things is he's not just like hey dudes. You know, like, you're totally not great. 
And like I was there and you were like, hey, I'm going to beat you up because you're not a king and we don't like you and we're going to throw you out. Right. <laughs> so he comes back then at Hikara for revenge, but then he fails. But then he has this whole ritual. Right. And the point of the ritual isn't just to be like, hey, Nehekara, you, you're jerks, right? Like, he's not just like schoolyard bully being like, I'm going to go in and poison your river. I'm going to go and literally take all of you, right? So this 9 out of 10 die is not because he's like, hey, I'm going to bring you the plagues. He's like, no, 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 you're mine, right? I learned this magic. And this magic gives me this power. And so he didn't just kill them because he was like, I hate you and I want you dead, right? He killed them because he said, I hate you. I want you dead. But also, I want your bodies to make an undead army to terrorize the rest of the world. Not only am I going to kill you, I am going to take you and exact my vengeance upon you and upon the rest of the world, right? Mm -hmm. It's not enough to kill you. I also have to steal your body as well, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like we've heard this plot point before in the Mortal Realm. Weird. Him? I was just about to say, you're you're saying it with like some gravitas, like with some weight, as if like this is like this groundbreaking thing. But to your point, like, yeah, this is this is always his demo. Like, this is such an uh, (laughs) and I'm not going to imply that the moral realms is the rich. Obviously, not. that's not the case. But like it's it's um, maybe it was unheard of at at the time. But uh, Mm -hmm. he goes back to that. Well, quite. But Aaron, it's the first time. Yeah, I know. All right. So it's it's we're looking we're going back in time a little bit. We're reading we're looking history in the wrong direction. But um, yeah, no. good. So. Yeah, just like what I was saying, he comes back, he takes over Nehekara, he wins, he starts enact, he throws Alakaladazar into like the prison underneath the Great Black Pyramid that he has reclaimed. He starts doing his fantastic, the Great Awakening spell, which is his intent is to raise up every single person that's ever died and to bind them to his will so that he may take over everywhere all at once shocking i know it's almost like he's done this before oh what happened the last time oh something kind of like this so in the middle of his ritual at his greatest point alcala desire is stirred awake by two hunched shadowy figures that hand him a great blade of warp gotta be stone halflings what? gotta be halflings warp right? stone. i don't know they're, they're hunched, hunched they're, they're in cloaks small, nobody knows in cloaks, nobody right? knows no, no one knows i'll say this nobody now. knows no one who uses warp stone would ever be an enemy of Nagash. <laughs> Throwing that up there. Never once. Couldn't be. Couldn't be. So he takes the great blade of the destroyers, um, or whatever it is, and he walks up the stairs in a like stupor state. He's just barely like holding on, but his force of will is able to get him up the stairs to where the great ritual is happening. Where Nagash is gorged on the souls of thousands of the tribes people that like saw him as a god the like the he's harnessing every wind of magic that he can find he's grabbing at every piece of power he can to channel into himself to then cast this great ritual then al Desire just rears up and slashes him in the back and sends him to an unbelievable undeath that just makes him absolutely explode got and him gets sent to like just splits his soul apart to a thousand pieces and he is cast out into the realm not the realms well the realms um sure. yeah. into the world shattered his soul is shattered and all of a sudden al Kaladazar collapses and the ritual still kind of goes off <laughs> Kind of. I mean, like, I guess you could what say you're yes. saying is it's 100% exactly as he intended, and everything works out great for Nagash, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, nothing and bad cool. ever happens. Nothing bad ever happens. Except that there's no Nagash now to bind all the things to his will. Huh. Wonder what happens then. Wait, you need, like, some sort of conqueror so that, like, takes over. You're saying Al Kadazar, but I swear you're saying Teclas. Like, I literally swear oh, you're saying Teclas. And like literally, like you know, the spirit perhaps you know flees, you know, to a different maybe. place. But like, isn't destroyed, maybe. right? Like maybe no, it's not, not destroyed. Completely nope. destroyed. Maybe it still Shattered. like exists in some form or another, right? Wait, do you guys hear that? Well, I hear that it's 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 uh, coming from the distance. It's on the wind, but it's Tomb Kings. 
Two kings, kings, two kings, kings, two 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 patron of the show chrisling which is uh, yeah. do we learn anything new or meaningful about nagash especially with consideration for his future in the end times or age of sigmar um i think uh, succinctly no he's still a bum mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. pretty lame it's eh, we won't go able to sign it but um for the most part nagash this is just his basic boilerplate origin story told almost mm. as straight as possible like there's no frivolity to it there's no mm. like added little like ooh, ah, 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 ah. there's like there's only one meme which they don't actually name the skaven as skaven in the uh whenever the alcalazar gets the blade it's the it's not skaven wink wink they're just hooded <laughs> no. and hunched wait um, skaven exist no well, yeah because this is the meme no. right you've yeah. heard this meme yeah. over this and over and over again in the age of sigmar oh skaven don't exist people don't know that they're real nobody says it's no. an age of sigmar no, no, no. nobody says it's an age of sigmar because they say it in the old world and in the old world skaven don't exist they are so sneaky they are so like just like otherworldly they don't actually exist people genuinely don't believe that they are real right mm. and the meme comes from here this is where the meme comes from um and as far as like actually nagash and like his history and where he comes from i I didn't see anything that was like super new super engaging super like this is another aspect of his story that i had not heard before right we do get that in these books for other races for other things right yeah if you were somebody who said the old world was great and the end times was terrible and this is an apology from games workshop for ruining warhammer fantasy battles i'm repeating a meme like this is me i'm repeating a meme this is not what this book is right no because we start off with where did the old world come from we have spaceships we have direct combinations of facts saying no yeah this is elder like we're literally going back to the beginning and we're saying, no, 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 we're going to reset this setting to align with the mortal realms is going to exist. And you know this now from step one, right? So if that's what your thought was, where this is going, that's not where it's going, right? We're going to go back and we're going to retell these stories because people love these stories. People who work at GW love these stories and they want to tell them again. Right. One of the things in this specific story that I love that is like for me a super like cool little thing is that when Al Qadazar runs away from the Cripple Peak, he meets a wizard. Right. And you're like, okay, he meets a wizard, whatever. Wizard didn't matter. Right. But he meets a wizard and the name is Kadan. And to me, that is important because Kadan is a wizard who had a spell named after him in 8th edition, which was called Kadan's Transformation, where you get to transform into a beast, right? And not only does he have this spell, but there's also this whole story that they had in the old world before it got blown up in Warhammer Fantasy Battles of, where does Kadan come from? What is his story, right? So they're actually enriching what they used to have by pulling these things in together, right? So... To be 100% honest, it is possible that that is what it said in the old Tomb Kings book in the old world. And maybe it is only because I'm looking through the lens of the old world is gone, moving on to the mortal realms. But I don't remember that Kadan was the person who made this thing important, right? And Kadan Mm -hmm. was somebody who was in a place called the Merchant Princes. And the Merchant Princes is a place that is super important to this narrative that we are listening to the old world right now because, hey, guess what? That's where the Tomb Kings are going to show up in the old world. Because, big spoiler here, the old world is not actually the entire globe of Warhammer Fantasy Battles. The old world is actually a specific place in Warhammer Fantasy Battles. 
And the specific place of the old world is, is not where Nehekara is, is not where the Tomb Kings are. There's actually a place below the Tomb Kings called the Southlands, which is where a whole different race of lizard men come from. There's actually a place across the sea called Lustria, which is where the lizard men come from in general, right? There's all this history and all this cool, rich narrative. And we're, we're getting this now. We're, we're getting these retelling of stories and we're getting a lot of the details that we didn't get before. And for me, like, that's the super exciting thing about the old world coming out is we're tying these specific things that we were never told because nobody that wrote a, a narrative in 1980 went, you know what? In like, you know, 25, 35 years, we're going to decide that we're going to make a new setting and we're going to draw these plots forward. But now, because they know that this exists, they can do that, right? We're actually drawing these through notes. And to me, that's the super exciting and super engaging part of rereading this story of the old world. Uh, also, just in case we get any emails coming up, um, it's given our name to actually in the sort of historical background in terms of talking yes. about Nagash getting his warp stone and then also uh, our boy would get in the knife and stab in Nagash. So I think maybe in some parts mm -hmm. we keep it uh, dodgy, but in the actual like they do a little timeline, which I feel like we haven't gotten those in a while with like years attached anymore. They do drop yeah. the name Skaven in, which is kind of a bummer knowing that like we know that Skaven aren't really in the game, right? So it's a little tease, but that doesn't yeah, really yeah. help us all that much. Out. Catch right. you guys later. Sick. All right. Well, that was yeah. the rule book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, that's yeah, just one of the books. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's interesting because the rule book itself kind of covers the lore pre them being tomb kings it mm -hmm. covers the mm -hmm. history of the faction and it covers the moment where they're all kind of turned uh then if you want to see how they actually operate in the time of the old world you want to hop on over to the arcane journal Ooh, yeah Ooh. it's like about time was one thing but an arcane, arcane journal yeah. it, seems, it seems magical but oh, also personal so it's a journal right like it's a little <laughs> it's a little journal i know like it's, it's, it's like yeah. really intimate is what that's you're allowed like. to write in it yeah <laughs> Not me, though. I would. I have all sorts of journals up on that shelf that have never once seen, had a pen grace them, and they never will. Never. They're just, they're just fun to have. Um, they're fun to have. I love, yeah. Oh, yeah. I read one. By the nose. The Arcane Journal kind of breaks things down a little bit more and kind of ties into, like, how the faction works and operates. We go over some of the cities that Tristan had mentioned earlier, like Kemri, the City of Kings, Numas, which is the Scarab City, which is based on the god of death as uh, Zandri, which is the fleet port of terror and then mm -hmm. Nibaras, which is the tomb city of asaf which kind of brings us to another listener question which is coming from fredericks which is how do these bony guys relate to neferata i mean first of all you don't need to call me bony and second of all oh. i don't know i like neferata i would you <laughs> oh oh he means okay oh, i get it yeah. no, I, I understand sorry you can relate to her because she's just girl bossing and i get <laughs> that just like me <laughs> just like me sure um yeah so uh it, in and tristan correct me if any of this is wrong even though i'm going off when i'm reading in the these books um <laughs> nobody goes off uh, on this podcast are you kidding me yeah never uh we've got uh, Neferata, who is coming from the city, and she decides that she wants to do her own thing. And she kind Hashtag of goes Gopas. over to Lamia and starts studying with them, finds that cool little uh, beverage that they have that gives them power, and yeah, kind of joins life. that cult. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I, I do think it's a fun little connection um, to like some of the things they're teasing in the mortal realms because we've been hearing of tainted blood poisoning people and it's fun that that's a callback to what's happening in the old world mm -hmm. uh, yeah i, I love that very much enjoy uh yeah, yeah so how do they weird. relate is she is nehekaran and yeah. she was it's not perfectly clear but she was a part of lamia who they followed in the gash but she maybe was doing her own thing within that as well is that correct Mm -hmm. So with this, it's um, 
with what they tell you in the in these modern books it's that modern. yeah she wanted more she wanted more power and so she decided to go to the side of nagash to gain you know the superpowers of vampirism and with that she was able to take over like the city like she became like the leader of lamia and um that's how they relate um we won't mention how raised lamia gets uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's right. something that they can read about um yeah. yeah and she um is also supposed to be the cousin of a special character who will not be named later um which is the dear sainted kalita who like the whole thing with um Neferata was that she was jealous of her cousin and then like that's what led her down the path of damnation yeah. but kalita is oddly absent in this book but hopefully we'll be coming back later we'll see all right all right here to a real I really queen. hope so oh man me too um, yeah well, so that's that and just like another random callback because if i'm right asaf is like a serpent god in tomb king culture and then they had revealed that a new lamian vampire has a the aspect of a serpent god with them so i'm loving these little callbacks um i don't know that too i thought i was so excited yeah yeah i was so excited when that new um espionage person for neferata got revealed for aos because apparently she's all about having like little griblies and that's why i did the the spiders and the centipedes because i think uh, her big thing is going to be that she has like creatures and like um no, with her. so that's why i was doing that because it's like well if i want to represent this more on the table i gotta that's get my conversion on yeah. yeah there is like because you mentioned how to do that on the tabletop there is an idea i have in my mind of taking her and then using the tomb kings as so blight grave lord models yeah and then just doing new lamia as a an yeah. army that way um <laughs> I can give you a whole bunch of ideas that I have that I won't do. <laughs> oh, I don't have enough time. Yeah. Not enough time. Yeah. Um, did you guys have any favorite of the cities that they talked about a little bit? I'd be curious. Zandri. <laughs> love Zandri. Zandri's super cool. Yeah, I, I love it. So that's all. Right on. Nice. Trist- Tristan, do you have a favorite city? Uh, I don't. Mm, I, it's really tough for me because I like a lot of them are my favorite for many different reasons. Sure. Um, obviously, because it's my favorite thing. I really love... Uh, Ah, God, I can't pick a favorite. Uh, Numas is one of my favorite ones just for the idea of what it could be because Numas is, as Will was saying, the city that's like venerates the scarab and it's all about... um, It has a mixture of life and death within it. So like it has like a whole bunch of living people that treat the one of the kings of Numas as their god and that dude was like this is sick this is funny i like this you guys can stay um and yeah so like took in a tribe of people and so they actually have like people tilling the fields like with numas it's right in between two of the larger rivers it's between mm-hmm. the um the not the river vite but the great morris river um and on, and another one and so like it actually has a little bit of vegetation it can actually be survivable and so with that, it's like you get this cool combination of like undeath and life. And so like that just makes my mind pop off. Where it's just like, think of all the cool conversions that you could do. Oh, my right? God. Right. Mm. And like the play styles, like I think could be so much fun because you could have like a cool mounted army that has like the mixture of the different units. And you could have this, the humans be the chaff for all the Tomb Kings. It'd be perfect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. It is funny though, like the rulers is like, look at these guys, look at these guys farming. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Look at their that's weird, food. right? That's that's weird. Yeah. You remember so that's that? Special. <laughs> <laughs> that's special. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, that's a good point. Well, I suppose they ate at one point, so the, it's not yeah. a completely foreign or alien concept to them. But like, they're getting a chuckle out of it in my yeah. head. In my head, it's too. like parents laughing at something kids are doing. <laughs> oh, you're gonna grow out of that when you get older, yeah. um, or you, <laughs> when you become a skeleton. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I was going to say, I like, uh, what is it, Maharak? Because it's King Far who stood up against Setra and was pretty successful and up until the day he ended up dying. He's like, we did it. Setra is not going to take our city. Awesome. At that point, the mortuary cults weren't a thing. So I'm sure it was a shock to him when he woke up undead. <laughs> uh, what the heck is going on? Found out his descendants started following Setra got yeah, yeah, real yeah. peeved 
and then kind of scattered their tombs all over them. It's like, nope, we're not doing this. You kids you don't respect all. your elders. <laughs> he killed them before they were undead and he scattered them all over the place. I yeah. love it. <laughs> so ridiculous. Uh, weird, weird fun fact. Uh, Fire used to be the king of Numas, but then they kind of retconned it. So then they flipped it around. And so there's this actually like, I don't know, 10 to 15 page thing that got posted in the Tomb Kings Reddit. That's this person like working out how it could work. And it is <laughs> bonkers. <laughs> I'm here for it. Sure. Yes. So, yeah. Send me a link. We'll put it in the show notes. Just kidding. I'll forget. No, I yeah. won't. <laughs> Aaron, what's your favorite? Uh, it was uh, Ma Rock. Uh, there's also the Quatar, um, which is the guardian of the mountains. But is that particular? I don't know if it's all that interesting. And that they've got a lot of like, they're pretty rich. They're pretty wealthy. What do you mean? Um, uh, they've got, I don't know. Uh, it's at the other end of the Chernal Valley. It's so <laughs> sick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, so sick. Dude, it's the, the other one. one. It's, well, they're like, they're like the, the, the twin cities of this huge path that's just laden with that all these neat. massive structures. So like sure. all these huge constructs that are the size that are cut into the cliff. For God mm-hmm. God's Might you say they're, God's the, sakes. they're on the opposite um, sides of the, the Valley of, of Kings? Yes, I would. Yeah. Uh, Oh is, that a real, oh, is that a real thing? That's a real, okay. That's, that's a real thing. That's there's a valley of the kings, yeah. and so there's a city on the other side. Uh, and again, it's one of these things where, like, you take a real world thing, but then you twist it a little bit, and then you go, okay, we're going to have two different cities on either side of this valley. True. Mm-hmm. Completely different aspects, and uh, yeah, I love I, it. I suppose it's cool in that, uh, if you're going to compare it to the real life uh, structure or monument, to be you could walk by in real life and be like, you know, wouldn't it be cool if these huge ass statues? Uh, what if they came to life? Wouldn't they be wild? And so, like in the in the I was going to say in the old world, that's a real possibility, something you have to worry about. So that mm-hmm. in and of itself is pretty cool. I'll give it that. Um, mm-hmm. So neat. I think does that cover all of them? Coincidentally, with the same number, I guess the big guy, uh, Kemri itself, is also listed here. Uh, yeah. Um, also, but no one ever picks the popular one, is no it? right because it's lame. Oh, no. it be the lame. Oh, no, the lame. Decides that we'll get into it later. But the popular one will be a really cool one to play. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good. Um, there's there's a whole bunch of other really neat cities. Like the land of the dead is littered with all these little ones, and you can find all about them just by scrolling through the map on the old world website. Mm. Have you guys done that? No, I like, should. It has. It, oh man, it's so it's so great. So you go to the old world website, then you scroll to the bottom. It has this map that's like kind of interactive. You can spin around to all the different little things, and they have like little blurbs for each one of the cities. Ooh. So you can find all about like Toramok, and like you can find. Oh, so good! I love that. That's awesome. Yeah, this it is, is so much fun. Super cool that they are able to do now that they weren't able to do in the old world, right? Which is all right we're going to put in reasons why these places exist, right? And one of the things that I really liked is they're like, okay, the mortuary cult went like, okay, we helped Nagash. And Nagash is all of a sudden crazy, right? And so we're like, hey, we don't want another Nagash. So the members of the mortuary cult go, we're actually going to hide our armies in completely random places that only we know, right? And then we're going to guard them with constructs. And so... Whereas before it was like, why are the Tomb Kings fighting in Kislev? Why are the Tomb Kings fighting in Britonia? Like, this makes no sense because this is where their empire is. They go, no, actually, people went here and planted these armies here because they were like, I'm just super paranoid. Right. And well, that little thing. They used to own out there. That's the thing. They used, like, that used to be part of the empire. And these are cities that slowly faded away into antiquity. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Like super cool, little bit of touch that adds so much to the way that you play your games. And I love it. It also adds so much to my wallet because I just want to make Tomb Kings that are from all the different points <laughs> and all the different types of things. I want to like, see your Tomb Kings. Ones. I want yeah. on ones. I want, oh, that's easy. Just go look at Dan, uh, <laughs> Dan Brewer's Tomb Kings. They look like they're Bretonian anyway. Amazing guy. Look him up on Instagram. Wicked dude. They look Bretonian. Sorry, Dan. This, this old, this <laughs> old world map is cool as heck. It can be found at theoldworld.com. Also, dang it, we really should have gotten that URL. I mean, I, bet, I bet they had to pay a penny for that one. Um, they did mm-hmm. the old world. Can we do old world? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, just Twist like it around the, on them. The moral realms versus moral realms.com. Hey, yeah. if anybody ever wants to try and sell us moral realms.com, don't because I can't afford it. So don't bother. Um, yeah. But I appreciate the offer. Though. <laughs> I guess you could gift it um, to us. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, we're going to get back into the story of when the old world launches, which the, the story is called Cetra's Fury. Ooh, so angry. Uh, and we start off with the awakening. It doesn't 
directly say in any of these books his awakening. I think it can be found in the Bretonian Arcane Journal. But apparently what happened is a bunch of honorless Bretonian thugs uh, robbed one of the tombs and absconded with possibly the king himself and maybe some relics. And so Cetra is going to go get revenge. And there's something beautifully poetic to me about Bretonians, a nation that are full of knights and honor, facing one guy who's got more titles in his names and they have knights in their army <laughs> telling them that they are honorless dogs and that he's going to come get them. <laughs> um, I didn't read the okay. Bretonian book yet. So you're telling me this is the start of the story is in that book instead? I I am assuming it is because the start of this story isn't in this book. Okay. So I'm assuming it's we're real. There. We're real good at this. <laughs> uh, we're oh, yeah, Age of Sigmar podcasters. Um, so, okay. But at the very least, uh, we know that the Tomb Kings are, are on a mission then, right? They're going to bring yeah. the fight northward, which yeah. uh, is, I, I don't know how often that used to happen in the actual like confines of Warhammer fantasy mm -hmm. previously. I mean, I guess mm -hmm. you could always argue that it would, but like, story-wise, I don't know if it happened all that much. It, it um, didn't happen all that much, no. Because nope. they used to have to have a crusade to get down into the part of the world where the Tomb Kings were, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. is why that little bit of like, we're going to hide them everywhere, right? Adds so much. Because it, it gives a reason. That's all. Sure. Super cool. Mm -hmm. I like yeah. that. Very neat. Um, and Cetra has this great invasion plan uh, that he's going through. And one of the yeah. branches of this plan is to find this missing tomb king. And the person in charge of it has decided that obviously the wood elves who are defending the mortal humans are obviously the bad guys who are doing all of this. Sure. And so they go in and they tear all of Tor Unrock down. Uh, high, high elves in this case, right? Right, because wood elves are probably oh, yeah, high, in the woods. Yes, yes, uh, high elves, sure. yeah. Because I will not have you besmirching the good name. They're the same. Wood elves. Um, uh, you, son of a gun. No, actually, yeah, this, it's, I looked at the timeline. The the winter of woe or whatever it happened a long, long time ago. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so Slaughter's the, the high elves. Um, which brings us to a listener question after slaughtering all of these innocent high elves. Sure. Uh, from mm -hmm. the patron Domir. Do the Tomb Kings feel evil now, or are they actually neutral like they were previously? They're not good. <laughs> what? They gave them a chance. This was a very, and I hate to frame it in a Mortal Realms perspective, but it's a very Bone Reapers type of like, oh, spiel, boom, boom. right? They come, I know, I know, but they come knocking on our door. They say, hey, look, give us something that we want. If you do, we're cool. But if not, we're going to take you out. And... They so basically in this situation they're asking the high elves, hey, look, where's the where's the where's the body of this king? Uh, you have to know, and they're like, terrible. We literally, we have no idea who you're talking about. Like, we can't help you. All right, that's the that's the wrong answer. And um, I think they what do they they not scuttle, but they send all sorts of underground like they're scorpions and underground stuff to like seize them from inside, and they tear that nonsense down. My point yeah. is is. Is that evil? They don't move their army in. Is it, no. is it evil? <laughs> also, it's much more cared on overlords because they're like, listen, here, here's the contract if you want. Yeah. Like, okay. this right also now. true. Mm -hmm. Yes or no. Uh, you clicked X for no. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. A complete rising up of scarabs and, mm -hmm. and, and things just overflowed and like absolutely wrecked the place. So not even a skeleton was damaged to take yeah. that whole fort. Mm -hmm. And oh. it's where we got to see one of the cool independent characters. Mm -hmm. Apple fast. Yes. Such so, a sick dude. The moral question is, is it cool to grave rob? Because that's apparently what the Bretonians did if they have, you know, the, the body of the Tim King, right? I mean, my answer to this question is they're not evil. They're fighting Bretonians. They're the good guys. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I agree with you 100%. Well. Do you have a thing yeah. against Bretonians? Do I not know that about you? Uh, I just think it'd be a funny meme. Okay. All right, well, good bit. Good I'm, bit. A, I'm a board. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Okay. Good bit. I'll, also, shout out to my boy Demir. You, going you back tell to me what you need. Pass. Yeah, right. Okay, sure. One hundred percent. Like one of the coolest sculpts that was ever made for the old world. I, I, I own Apple yes. Pass. He is absolutely amazing. Um, I love that he is coming back because he is such a cool model. He has such a good history, right? Like mm -hmm. he's basically Nagash Junior, right? Because as we were talking about in the background, Nagash is like, hey, I love this power so much. I'm going to kill my whole family. Right. Nice. I like what everyone's it. doing. And Prince Applegrass is like, hey, you know what? 
I love power so much. I'm going to kill my whole family. Right. And it's awesome. I, I, I love that they have this like actual narrative reason to move forward. Right. And, and we were talking about this elven outpost, right? We have actual battles that have real consequences. This is something that never happened in the old world. I can't tell you the number of battles that happened in Nome. I can't tell you the number of battles that happened in my clan. I can't mm-hmm. tell you the world obliterating meteor that showed up in Mordheim that somehow never affected the rest of the realm, right? This is where old world is going to be super awesome and super fun yeah. because we're driving the narrative forward. We have a narrative. We are establishing where we are and we're going to move forward. And I am here for it. Yeah, the thing I like the most out of this book is just the map that has the troop movement uh, yeah. lines. Just like more of that. Every book should have that. Tell me yeah. what is happening in what order, how that is affecting the future of the campaign and how that is moving things. Mm, it's so nice. Mm-hmm. I really, yeah, I think this is a really great story since it ties in with the high elves. But then there's also that little subsection whenever a little um, uh, a little another one of the tendrils going along ends up fighting a whole bunch of orcs. Yeah, so it's just it's a great little it's a great, great story that I think Which, is really fun. This yeah. is what I love about Ford World, right? This is what I loved about Tamarkan in the old world. This is what I loved about the monstrous Arcanum. We get these super fun stories that move the story forward. And when we had them before, the old world wasn't allowed to move forward because the old world is what it is, right? Now, the old world is Fort World. We can actually move them forward. And we're talking about Kadan, right? The Monstrous Arcanum was one of the best stories I read, period, the entirety of the Warhammer fantasy battles. And we're getting this now in the main narrative, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Tristan, you had mentioned one of the branches going off to fight orcs. That is where the story kind of continues and leaves off. Uh, cause mm-hmm. Asher attack is moving along. He's trying to find more clues of to where, you know, King, uh, Septa, Septa is. Yeah. And he, they keep on getting attacked by orcs. And he's like, you know what? I know what orcs love fighting. Mm-hmm. So let's get a big fight going and we're just going to wipe out these orcs. And he gets what he's asked for in a massive orc horde. And the leader of the orc horde has got this cool little banner on his back, which has got the rotting skeleton of King Septa. <laughs> I like to think so, that it's like, he's just like a little bit of this. Yeah. Uh, this, this is what I love <laughs> about orcs in the old world. Why are they important? Because he's literally carrying the body of the main protagonist on his back. Yep. Yeah. Wait, wait, that doesn't make any I don't care. I'm an orc. Right? It's what he's doing. Oh but I love that, like, they're going out to the Bretonians, they're killing high elves, they're doing all this, and it's really just orcs and goblins, like, goofing off, doing whatever they want to do. Yeah, they just strapped to the, brunt, to the front of their hot rod. They're just like, it looks sick, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> witness! Shiny and chrome. Yeah, so they end up having a big dust-up, big battle, and... Uh, yeah, constructs do be constructing, and they just smash the living heck out of them. Or un, unliving. I don't know. <laughs> no living, unliving, some, somewhere in between. Uh, I will say, at least in that part of the story, it ends right before the fight finishes. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because he's like, I know that I'm going to, I'm definitely going to win this. Nothing bad will ever happen. And I'm assuming whenever the Orcs and Goblins book comes out, we will figure out something. Oh, bad. you think it's going to be like a... Like a jump from one to the next. I, the next. That's why. That's why I think the story started in the Bretonia book. I think okay. we're going to see a th- like through line story across the arcane journals. Um, Ooh, because that's they, fun. On the map, we've got high elf troop movements. So like, oh, that's fun. I, I that is my belief, and I won't know until we see more. But sure. Um, they, a, they used to do that. Cry. They used to do that in Eth. Uh, Eth. Aaron, what is wrong with you? Eighth edition. Um, in that. Uh, I think all the hardcovers in eighth, um, there was a, a through line that was leading up to the end times, which I, I know people don't like, but I don't oh, care. God, we just um, oh. again. Yeah, no, but I, well, I, yeah, I can't imagine. But it was cool that every single book you you I would thumb through it to find the blurb about whatever the on running story was going to be because it was about all the stuff uh, before Sigmar's Blood, which is a little cool campaign book that oh, they put out that was the awesome. precursor to the end times. So this good. is back when nice. I was actually into uh, 
fantasy. Um, nice. I thought you say Warhammer. I mean, you know, back when <laughs> into following Warhammer. <laughs> You're not wrong. Um, so uh, good. Like like Tristan said, he's using the local parlance. Good scry. Um, Bravo. Nice. I love that. But yeah, that, that's a great point. That the fact that they cut the story off right before the battle, so you actually get to do the battle you can create your own yeah. lore you can create your own story from it such a cool thing mm-hmm. yeah yeah oh, the and bretonian I'm, book just as an aside it does have like the lines moving uh, like mm-hmm. not, i can't read it fast enough to tell you nice. what it's about but um oh yeah another fun part is yeah it leads into a narrative battle plan like you're able yeah. to tell the story you're able to do it and that's like the one that you get it's i love I, it I think it's a really great way to do that because like there's a lot of army books, a lot of codexes, a lot of battle tomes where like there's just like and here's a narrative battle report that's fallen out of the sky and you're just like, cool, skip. But like I legitimately want to do this like a thousand percent want to do this battle plan, um, which is not something I do often with the narrative battle plans, which is a shame because I know people put in the work. I always had a dream that we would make content around those, right? Like we have plenty of armies and such and this is maybe more mortal realms based stuff but like in that like we we could probably put together a lot of these armies to to do the battle plans for the different books and stuff that came out i feel like i don't think anybody's really doing that that could be like interesting stuff especially because most people don't have all those armies right not every your average person doesn't have access to run through the way run these things through the way they were meant to be run through um so a little like curiousness but counterpoint yeah battle or pep Battle reps are almost impossibly hard to do. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. God. for sure. And I don't know how to play the game, so like, I don't, it's step one. How do I how how I roll dice? Um, I don't. I'm not sure. They fall. I don't know. They go like that. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a beautiful thing uh, to finish off with. Yeah. So that is kind of the story and like the history that they show us in these books for uh, the Tomb Kings of Kenbury. Uh, but enough with the story, like how do they actually operate? Mm -hmm. Um, like to go back to how we do in our traditional episodes, how is the faction organized and how do they live at home? How do they assemble themselves together for war? Are they still city states? I guess I, I remember. Yeah. So, um, the way that the armies are organized, there's kind of almost like two there's sort of like three different ways that you can play them there's the Mm. more traditional sense where it's like a nice mixture of units where you get kind of the uh big like the army that if you've ever seen a tomb king army you'd expect like has skeleton warriors skeleton archers like they march in big blocks of skeletons as rob credis as robin credis says it's a army of skeletons and constructs so everything kind of lays into that And in one of the earlier army books, it lays out that they're an army that seems expensive, slow, and not very good in combat. And you're supposed to be able to use the buffs from your kings, from your princes, and from your lich priests to build them up to be a greater force. Because that's kind of the whole point of the two kings is that they were an amazing fighting force when all banded together. And... This army works with its big bricks of skeletons, be they light skeletons or hard skeletons, we'll call them, the tomb guard or the tomb <laughs> or the uh, the warriors. And then there's also all the things that are riding horses or are being pulled with chariots. This is a great army for people who love things that go fast. <laughs> yeah. Because um, there's a whole bunch of different ways for you to whip across the battlefield there's horses there's dragons now which is sure. insane um there's the war sphinx which was one of the sculptures um then there's also scorpions there's gigantic colossuses all these things just march across the battlefield in these nice big ranks um it's basically a big wall of skeletons followed up by a few special different things and that's kind of the core way to form your army right now the um arcane journal um, that's that's what we call the Tomb Kings of Kemri. That's kind of like the traditional army. Mm-hmm. In the Arcane Journal, it unlocks two other play styles which follow like lock and key with the way that we've described mm-hmm. kind of the lore of the army. Mm-hmm. There's the Nahakarn Royal Hosts, which are the chariot and kind of a mounted focus and like much more tricksy with their movement. They're the ones that can send out waves upon waves of chariots to slam into the enemy that has sneaky skeletons that will pop up on the side of the battlefield. They're the ones that are a lot more martial and a lot more like tricksy in their cleverness of how they operate. Like, cause these are supposed to be 
amazing battlefield generals right and so that, mm-hmm. that's how they show this with the rules and with the army lists and then the next one is the mortuary cults themselves and how they lead their own armies out for them it's all about the spells and the constructs and all the different little gribbly things that might pop up out of the ground so like they're the ones that can call up the scorpions the new necro serpent units the um the different things that aren't so much like just these martial bricks they're all about the magic and they're all about having the gigantic monsters stomp across the table and squish your head mm-hmm. while they're at the back going do it do it get him get that guy get the big guy yeah. Arise, my champion. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of like the three different ways that you play them you play them kind of like one that's kind of like straight up trad one that's uh go fast and one that is cool stumpy monsters and that kind of speaks to how like the the powers that exist in the culture today, right? Like, so you got a, you've got a series of these kings that have been risen up, and they're not going to relinquish their power. Now, admittedly, they still all answer up to Cetra, but like they still got their fiefdoms, isn't the word, but their areas of control, and they they lead their own forces. And so, like, obviously, they're in control over their resident when the, their subjects i guess maybe that's what the skeletons mm-hmm. are these are their subjects basically yeah. um whereas the mortuary cults didn't go nowhere they're still in power here they still um are do do we are we to assume that they're still trying to figure out uh immortality or is that no longer oh, yeah. a concern anymore because no no no, no, no. So, mans. The, so the mortuary cult are still trying to figure out how can we fix this because cetra is like you are gonna fix this I'm going to get my perfect golden skin god body sure. that you promised yeah. me, or I'm going to put each piece of you into a different part of the world. <laughs> um, so like they they still have their mission and they still mm-hmm. are trying to like still retain power. Like the interesting thing about the mortuary cults with the models and how they're shown is that they're not ostentatious with how they are. They're kind of like, trying to hide how much power they have yeah. over society over the armies you can see that in the models like they don't have the big race collars they don't have the gigantic like hats they don't have like the huge uh, like shields like they have just like smaller like they yeah yeah they're just so much less fancy yeah it's like a real it's, it's a real secret cabal type situation and if you the fans exactly. you get the bigger target you have on your back and they don't they're not in it. They're in it for real power. Well, I guess I'm not going to say that imply the kings don't have power because they absolutely do. But like there is a different brand of power that is, uh, you know, kept secret, kept uh, close to the vest um, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. and the last priest who had a big hat kind of ruined it for everybody. So <laughs> they just want to distance themselves as much as they can. Mm-hmm. Exactly. They won't read books too. Yeah, the books. Uh, the <laughs> they don't do it. <laughs> um. Yeah, one thing I thought was interesting in that, because we have some of the special characters like uh, High Queen Kalita, I mean, not in this book, but, uh, and then Neferata, and like there are the mentions of the various like queens throughout uh, the two mm-hmm. kings. And it does just specifically call out like, oh yeah, all nobility in the Hikari culture, they are raised as warlords. It mentions like, oh, the Bretonians might be reciting poetry to someone. <laughs> someone else might be, you know, living amongst their people. Now, Nehekara nobility are bred to become generals and warriors and leaders. And that includes the men and the women. That's what they do. That's who they are. Doesn't matter. Uh, Whichever yeah. order you were born in, that's your role. And guess what? If you're born first, you're going to be the one that leads the kingdom. Yep. And if you're going to be leading the kingdom, you better know how to wield a kopesh. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and that's like right in the first couple pages, too, which I think yeah. is awesome. Like they're yeah. just shouting out the fact that, yeah, the queens and like the princesses are absolute murder machines. Yeah, it's two things. One, very Sparta, oh, cool. Sparta reference, right? Like uh, that's what their jobs are. They have to fight. Um, and then, but two, I wonder. It, whether we know or not, I don't know. Did they make it a point to folk like to really highlight the princesses and queens in the previous books, or is this? Do we think this is a, a direction in, in a, a, a positive direction that they're heading in in more of a modern day? I wonder. So, in comparison to the old books, it is a lot more egalitarian. Okay. Um, with the, but it's still by variance of degrees because mm. it's still like in the old books, uh, like. Uh, Neferata and yeah, herself, like, they exist are seen them. as well not only do they exist but they're also like they're deadly oh like, sure I, I should say um, them like, and, the, and the character and everything that goes along with them exists. they, get, they gave Kalita them. rules to strike at the fastest of almost anyone in the entire game because she is such a badass yeah <laughs> cool model and, too um, yeah we don't have to get into that uh, 
Yeah. And so with the older books, like they focus a lot on the beauty of the beauty and the deadliness. But in this one, it's just very much a like uh, they're here to kill people and it's really cool. So it's I I really like this version of the book so far compared to the other ones that I've read and like have obsessed over for years. I think this is a really great way that if you've been kind of interested in Tomb Kings, you're going to adore this book yeah it's going to be mm-hmm. something you're so jazzed on if you start reading it like all the little stories like all the little hooks like you know just all the nice little things i know for me whenever it came to uh diving into this book the thing that i was super jazzed on was all the little lore sections that come with the unit entries because i know going back and through the different army books that that's something i i just love about the fantasy books is how they have like your unit explaining what the rules are but then at the same time it's also all the cool little lore bits do you guys have like some favorites of the units that you were looking at did you just steal our own segment and use it against us i am the the captain now (laughs) (laughs) who's your real king blowing us down but then he can take the reins and pull us forward sure i guess he hit liege those are my pronouns like a like a chariot basically Um, um you're my pony I I mean, not any specific, I guess if I'm going to say specific, I'm just going to say Necrosphinx, but mostly just calling out, I love the construct part of the Tomb Kings as a whole. Like, I think that and the Necrotex and, well, like, I don't know, it's just super cool because they, because it's not just, oh, they raise skeletons. They also do this and they did this for a reason. They have these constructs to override the fact that maybe they can't control all the skeletons if Nagash comes back. And the way they shaped, like Paul was saying, like they took Egypt and twisted it. And the way they twisted some of those ideas to fit into this world. Oh, this is a natural reaction to Nagash. And so that's why we're doing this. I think it's just such a cool thing. And also the constructs look cool. Oh, and so sick. Also so guys, sick. I your specific paint scheme and the way you do jade tristan is mm. so cool and it really Thanks. just highlights how cool the constructs are yeah it's i i'm right there with you man like the constructs are so cool they add such a great indiv- individualized um aspect to the army because like there aren't other undead armies that have gigantic bone monsters in them Mm. that are made out of jade sapphire all these other rare stones like there just aren't and like it just creates such a different um silhouette to the army it really makes it so like you feel the different sections of the army and it's something that i was like i know that's what really drew me into the army too whenever i was younger is like that i thought it was so cool that they had these big stompy things well, it's cool because it, it adds it, it's a multifaceted element to what could be a very mono, maybe monochromatic is or mono structural type monolithic. Arc. Yeah, yeah, there you go, just flat out monolithic uh, army. Yeah. And so it's almost it's almost necessary, right, to make it to add that bit of uh, variety to it. I'm not sure you can do it a million different things with bones, and and they will and have been doing so already. Um, but it adds like sort of this dichot- dichotomy in a similar mm-hmm. way to my favorite wood elves, how you've got your elves in your, uh, like your tree things, right? Like the forest spirits. I love that, like the split where you could do one or the other, do the intermingle. It's very similar in this uh, situation as well. Just mm-hmm. make it about me. Um, Just make it about you. But speaking of making it about you, what's what's something that tickles <laughs> your fancy? Um, I'm trying book. to think what my uh, favorites are. <laughs> I, it's, I loved the tomb skeleton idea. So I, the cool thing about the tomb kings is when we talk about fantasy Egypt, right? Um, like rattling mm-hmm. off the things that I didn't even know I associated with Egypt, but yet here we are. Or to take like, for example, like the scarabs. And like, I like the, I was joking before, I do kind of like the grizzly bits and the, it's, um, my favorite parts of armies like this are how you bring in the beasts. And so like, well, how do you bring beasts into a bone army? Um, well, in this mm-hmm. case, you make skeletons out of things, or make skeletons for things that don't even really have skeletons, right? A skeleton, uh, scorpion, as far as I understand, it doesn't have a skeleton, right? That okay, was an exo- it's skeleton. called an exoskeleton. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's not in the same. It's on the outside. Yeah, it's on the outside, Aaron, you idiot. A five-year-old um, can explain this. Like, sure. Well, keep up. I was a you biology major, ago. no less. Um, I should know these things. But the point is, is I think that's uh, particularly interesting. But the reason they're cool, though, is because it's not an undead skeleton but rather it's a thing that they made in the shape of a skeleton right like or like it's it's a repurposing Mm -hmm. of of like the image but still like conscious conscientiously devised and designed um which i think is particularly neat um and also one of the best things about them is how they uh 
can spend a lot of time underground. They're like the statues, which are stored sort of out, you know, in remote places. Um, and you never know, is that statue going to reach out and like smash me? He probably is in the same way that you never know if there's going to be a skeleton underneath you. They're like these ticking trap time bomb traps, which is also in my yeah. mind, a hallmark of ancient Egypt, right? Is these, these trapped areas, um, but have these, uh, skeletons swimming underground. If that's one way you want to describe it. Um, and then, leaping out and getting you and dragging you well, under yeah. if you have to well. it's like it's like how the sphinx in egypt that you they used to just be like oh yeah that's the big head and then they start excavating it and they're like oh it's a, <laughs> oh. It's a little bigger than the head yeah, just a smidge yeah. it might yeah. have a lion body sure. and you know what's even worse than having skeletons under you aaron is that mm. There is a skeleton in you right don't, yeah. now. I don't, know. Yeah. don't go there <laughs> speaking uh, of going there paul what's your favorite um, my favorite bit of lore that is in this uh, battle tome, if I'm going to use that colloquialism, right? I love the titles upon titles entry for Cetra. <laughs> that is literally <laughs> just like, I'm going to write 7,500 yeah. titles for Cetra and then put them as this is your entire entry for the lore. It's absolutely I want awesome. it. I was really hoping that they were going to have like the old world map, but then they would have a scroll for Cetra that you could buy and it would just cl clunk and then yeah. go for like <laughs> 10 feet. That, that's, that was my dream uh, weird merch item. <laughs> if only. <laughs> but that being said, I do have one slight disappointment, oh, no. which what? is I'm, I'm a fanboy of a specific character that did not make uh, it in the background, um, which oh, no. is fair, right? I understand why it's not, right? But one of the things we're going to talk about is that they added some stuff into the unit entries, which says, well, kind of like have some fun and make up something, right? Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. the character that I am missing, his name is Sahenismet. Oh, I thought you were talking about AKB. Oh. Qatar. And he has yeah. always been one of my favorite characters because nice. he is a lit priest bound into a bone giant. And his yeah. army is all constructs. So you yep. use, uh, you know, a Shabti as core. And like, I was like, please, please just like give us the rules <laughs> to be able to do this because this is amazing. And, yeah. and I don't see him and I miss it. That's all. Nah, that's too bad. I know. Yeah. I was pretty excited whenever I just read the unit entry that was necrolith colossus i was like yeah. oh my mm -hmm. god what does this it? mean just means that they're just uh just renamed bone giants to something <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but it's fine. um i know for uh, see i was really excited to see where you were going with what could this uh named character be because tomb kings have like six or seven different named characters and like they do you said like I was like, it's one of those like, oh, is he going to name the the guy from Zandri? That's all. That's like the the pirate guy. Is he going to name the arch necrotech uh, Rahom Tap? Like, where's he going mm -hmm. with this? That's so much fun. Um, yeah. I know for me, whenever I looked at the book, the thing that shook me to my core was flipping through it and then being like, wait, what's that? Because I saw two things that immediate or three things immediately that made me go, wait, what? <laughs> what? Uh, wait, what? Yeah, dun, 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 dun. yeah. Immediately uh, after, yeah. Wait, Aaron, did you want me to ask you what you liked? I already asked you what you. No, liked. you did. I said, I yeah, said you. First. You asked you when you saw them. You asked me what they were. Is what it was. So yeah, I yeah. I immediately was messaging you, just freaking out about it. Um, it was the necro serpents <laughs> and the tomb guard chariots. I was just mm -hmm. like, what is happening? Because necro serpents are what the tomb are what the. Uh, the necro the necropolis knights ride they're the big snakes with the big flaring hood that have the super strong venom that can turn people to stone or make them melt from the inside out depending on which one you read or turn to sand depending on what you read it's just basically you dead uh, <laughs> in this one they have the same like intensely um poisonous thing that uh desert snake has but they're not being ridden by riders they're just like all of a sudden these just things that'll pop up out of the ground and just wrap you up and kill you and i just think it's so sick that they like that they're taking kits and that they're create they're taking the lore that was already there because like i have pictures of them up here in my top right um you take the snakes that are already in the lore and you're creating a different way to tell a story with them yeah. which is so cool 
very reminiscent of what they did with like uh, flesh eater courts in moral realms, right? Like or when they yeah. when the AS, AOS began, they like right. Well, how can we use the kits that we have in different ways, or like repurpose them, or take something that is kind of already exists and make it so that it's its own individual thing? Didn't mean to interrupt though. Keep on going, oh, man. A thousand percent. But that that's a great point because they did that with like three or four different armies in mm-hmm. Age of Sigmar, and it's really cool that they took the things that they learned from Age of Sigmar, they brought it to this new game, and they're like, all right, what can we do? Let me cook. And then they came up with Tomb Guard Chariots, which if you whenever you're able to see the picture of the unit entry um, for all the listeners, um, I'm super stoked because it has three different kits that are combined to make it. They've got Tomb Guard, then they've got the King from the Necro Sphinx on it and the banner from that, too. So it's like it's this great mashup of a unit that gives them something that they didn't have before in a really fun way because tomb guard chariots, they just punch you in the face. That's all. That's what they do. They're just here to roll up and roll you. And I just, I think it's such a cool unit entry and something that tells a cool story because it's like, Oh yeah, of course they would have a chariot with tomb guard on it. Those guys are bad ass. Yeah. Like they are able to like, like just taking like what they have and they were able to make such cool different new things those are the two things that got me like absolutely out of my chair whenever i was like sitting on the couch scrolling through it scrolling through the book and i was just like oh my god (laughs) what is this this might be a controversial controversial opinion but i kind of like the necro serpents better without the riders i think they look cooler without somebody they look really nice it it almost seemed like that was a little cumbersome like how could anybody actually ride that thing um so like them by themselves I'm kind of into it. I'm I'm for it. You're not alone. I've had a, I've had a few people say that to me. Um that have seen like some of the that are other content creators and mm-hmm. i've just always been like but they have the cool hook bit. I love the cool hook bit. I mean i like to put and that on something like, else maybe, on? or maybe on a oh, chair. It's, it, it's yeah. a cool bit. It's a really yeah. cool bit cuz it's just yeah. like a guy with a gigantic fancy hook that he uses to hold on to the snake and he's just riding and being like <laughs> yeah. let's go. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's cool. I th- yeah. I really love that kit. Um, yeah. One thing I love to do is take a heat gun or something to them to make their tails extra wiggly. Oh, so wiggly. And they're already pretty wiggly. So like, it must be double wiggle, wiggly. Wiggle. Yeah. The, the thing I love about it is that it gives utility to existing kits without needing to add existing kits. Right. And, and what it might be that is that if you love Tomb Kings, you already have these boxes somewhere, right? And now you can just add them in different ways and make super cool things. And it gives you the license to be like, I'm going to just make something cool. And I'm going to tell you, this is what it represents, right? And I love that. I love the freedom to do something cool and not feel feel guilty about it. I was going to say, that's basically MO and the hobby is just like, you know what? Let's just make something cool. Yeah, let's just do it. It's Tomb Kings. Why not? Do I want a chariot that's actually a gigantic carrion that's being ridden by a tomb king? Yes. How am I going to make it? By doing something stupid. Like <laughs> It's spiders. Can I do something cool? Why not? Right? You know, yeah. have fun. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. These the opinions expressed on this episode do not reflect the opinions of the entire <laughs> Moral Realms podcast. Um, yeah. Solely Tristan Gray of <laughs> Party at the All Points podcast. No. Please like and subscribe. <laughs> Share. Tell a friend. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I thought it was really neat with the Arcane Journal and with the Ravening Hordes book, how they split it up, how they gave you the core units that you would expect to have in a Tomb King's army, like the fully playable list that you would come to love in the Ravening Hordes. And then you get all the extra spice in the Arcane Journal. It's so much fun. <laughs> Big That's fan. The spice must flow. For, you're advocating for one. It's a very desert reference. In fact, uh, Thank you. you're advocating for a bunch of different books, which is what we got. Um, hey, I just love uh, walking without rhythm into a conversation. <laughs> uh, hey, well, what else you got for us? Um, well, what else we have is we kind of talked about this a little bit, which was going to be the factions and sub factions which Tristan kind of mentioned before, the books come with three playable types of armies, yeah. which is your uh, Tomb Kings of Khemri, your Royal Host, and your Mortuary Cults. Uh, you also, if you wanted to, could customize your armies a bit more by basing them off of the existing cities. What is this, a uh, Cities of Sigmar? Uh, uh, cities, etc. No, oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. Yeah. Bang, bang, let's go. Hey, cities, etc. Oh, oh, yeah, there you go. Um they don't have like any official rules, but that's not going to stop anyone with 
uh, a paint and a dream of putting them together and creating Maharak, the best city. <laughs> a dream in their heart. Yeah. And one of the fun parts is for anybody that's list, that's played Total War, it's like you already know what the colors are. Like you can get the different like what the what the schemes should be what the iconography is and like they all have them for the cities that's one of the fun parts that's different about the old world is that it's so grounded that you have all this little these little bits of flair that you can just be like i'm just gonna pick up and play yeah and i think tomb kings give a little bit more freedom than i think maybe even some of the other factions in the old world will which is it's covering centuries of history so if you have a paint scheme that is completely different from any of the existing ones, just go, yeah, well, yeah, this guy's from the year 2200 and he was somewhere else. And now that civilization is gone. Who cares? And you can still do your own cool custom thing because there's so much more time and space that this faction covers compared to anyone else. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Uh, then from there, we've got the notable characters. We've kind of talked about them a bit, but there are three that are featured in this book that have models. Uh, first off is Setra the Imperishable. I think we covered that enough. Does anyone have anything new about Setra they want to talk about? About Setra himself? Yeah. Um, he is on a new base, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Oh. Instead, of the, instead of the four that were glued together and then one <laughs> big one at the back, now it's just one big rectangle. Do you want oh, to convert a base? Really? Come on. Come on. Yeah, come on. No, I just want to put them on a round base and ride off into the sunset. Um, for me with Cetra, I think that it's really notable that the Arcane Journal gives you so many cool little things, little details with him. And it's just going to be fun for people to find the extra little bits of spice and like how he supercharges an army. He is like the charioteer that um, will make the rest of your army go absolutely bonkers. And I love that they did that, that they made him like a focal point, a hub of your army, because he should be. He should be like, oh, oh man, Cetra is insane. Yeah. And like he is like he's commanding his force. I just love how they gave him rules and ways to play the game that echoed all the great narrative that he's had for years. I just wish they gave him other horses. That's all right, yeah, because... It's so weird because sometimes you're like, oh, that's a new model compared to an old model. You can see the difference. But for Cetra, it's the new model is the guy on the chariot and the old models are the horses pulling it. <laughs> and it's so weird looking. So brutal. Like, ah, uh, please, new horses. Yeah. Like, keep Cetra the same. Just give him new horses. And, like, I'd call that a success. True. Mm-hmm. It's just um, one sprue. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about Prince Apophis, the cursed scarab lord, already. Um, the only thing we never talked about was his specific curse is he oh, yeah. needs someone of an equal soul to replace him in the afterlife so that way he can go do cool things yeah the funny joke is that no souls are created equal and he's never going to find it so he's cursed for all eternity to roam and kill and just keep on looking weird weird sense of funny but okay sure yeah all right <laughs> uh, the gods of death have a funny sense of humor. Yeah, so they it's we, we talked about how he'd been locked in a he'd yeah. been locked in a casket with a bunch of dude when Paul was talking oh, yeah, about no. him, I forget. He was locked in a casket with a bunch of scarabs and then when they opened it later, uh uh they found that he was gone and all the scarabs were gone too. So um that's why he's a scarab. Save baby. save for his skull that was oh, etched yeah. with one single rune yeah. of <laughs> regicide yeah exactly i forgot about the cast part. into the cast into the great desert yeah, yeah. Uh, and whenever he was reborn after bargaining for his soul becoming the the scarab lord scarabs bubbled up from beneath the skull that was tossed into the desert and he was reborn yeah oh and he said he used to stab his entire family that was still possibly dripping with the blood of his family still dripping with that same blood always yeah, still good. dripping with that blood Always. Oh, ABD, so always sick. be dripping. Uh, then, yeah. this, one. <laughs> this isn't I mean, a Aaron, new... Bowden's taking over real quick here. <laughs> <laughs> um, this isn't a new character, but it's a new model, if I'm right, which is Nakaf, the Emissary mm-hmm. of Cetra, which the the 10 foot long scroll that Tristan was talking about, this guy's got it. It's pulling around his feet and it's just all of the titles of Cetra. Like, this dude is already huge. He's a beast. He's got his own little weapon. He would be an amazing king in his own right if Cetra didn't exist. But because (laughs) Cetra exists, this dude is simply the emissary of Cetra, going around telling them how much, 
how awesome this other guy is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he does. loves it. Yeah, he has he's to be buried anyway. with him alive first. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> to be buried on the right hand. Yeah, he's been. He has a gigantic flail of skulls. It's so sick. Uh, it's so nice. I love. So I don't know why you would ever put anything but skulls at the end of a flail, right? I think I don't after steeping myself so much into Warhammer, like when I think flail, I just assume it's got skulls at the end, and when it doesn't, I'm like, well, that's odd. That's weird. Yeah, <sighs> like you could have gone the cooler way with this. Sure, you chose to be worse. Yeah, why would you? You want yeah. if you have a flail, you want to scare somebody with it. You what's scarier than a skull? Nothing. It's the scariest thing. <laughs> My my friend Chris Froizen, who is a uh, gigantic Tomb King stan, he also got um, the the kits and everything early. He's done like some videos on YouTube, and he immediately cut all the little heads off the flail and immediately stuck on a whole bunch of cool skulls. <laughs> nice. Oh, nice! <laughs> so sick! That's you awesome. gotta do it. Mm-hmm. You do yeah. GW's work for them. Um, all right. Yeah. Um, then to kind of round us out, we've got uh, listener questions that were not covered in these sections above. Uh, we've got a few from Darth Alec. He always does. Uh, always My has guy. a few. He's great. It's he not me, his, it's him. Uh, keeps that podcast afloat. Yeah. Uh, since the old world is a much deeper setting, how do you feel the approach to lore differs from Age of Sigmar? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that is a good, like saying it's a deeper setting it, it makes sense because one of the, the things people always say about Age of Sigmar is that it goes wide, covers a lot of factions. This is very like specific. It's going into, oh, this family, the, these people, we have the troops marching. It's not trying to cover the entirety of the planet of Warhammer Fantasy Battles. It's covering just the old world. Mm-hmm. We're just covering these Tomb Kings and in the modern time. We're just covering this fight with Bretonia. And I think deeper maybe isn't the right word, but specificity is kind of like what I'm seeing is the difference between the two settings. Sure. One is much larger and expansive, and one is kind of focusing on a few named characters and a small area of land. I I guess always assumed that old world and not even old Warhammer fantasy content broadly. So before the old world came out, I always thought it was it's fairly like unapproachable or I got the impression it was unapproachable. So I never tried. I always thought, well, this is too, there's too much. There's no way I'm going to be able to get through it. The same thing with 40k. I, could, I couldn't even begin to think about how I could get into it. And I always thought that was true of uh, what uh, Warhammer fantasy stuff as well. So when they're like, all right, old world's coming, I'm like, all right, well, I got to lace, lace up. We're going to, we're going to have to dive deep into this because there's going to be a lot to like wade through. And I was surprised when I say pleasantly surprised, yeah, why not? We'll say pleasantly surprised that honestly, it was actually pretty approachable and not overwhelming. And I imagine they probably did that on purpose. They could really throw a ton at you. And I think they made the conscious conscious decision not to. Um, and so I think it's differencing, difference, like you said, maybe in, in vertices, right? Or different on, on different spectrums. But at the same time, I still think broadly speaking or generally speaking, it is as approachable as an Age of Sigmar battle tome is, I think. We talk about all, all the recent battle tomes lately. We think, all right, well, they could have gone deeper here or there, but they, they've they brought along some some of the old stuff. They, keep, they add some new stuff, and it's a nice little mix. I think it's not dissimilar here uh, to some degree. There's not as, as much new stuff, but there's still some. There's, it's not nothing. Um, and I think this is a good starting off point jumping off point um for people getting who are new to the setting or who are moderately familiar with that which is what i would consider myself um in that it wasn't daunting it, it almost to the degree that maybe i wish it could have been a little bit more I, I i could i could stand to do a little bit more be a little bit more daunted is that a word um but maybe that's a different book maybe that's a different supplement yeah. maybe that maybe that's that's never going to be the point of what this these types of things that we have released but rather it's it's going to be expanded upon later um and i'm looking forward to that i, I dip my toe in the water with these tomb kings i'll do it with the bretonians um but i i jazz to really you know get immersed eventually and i think well, this is now ended up being my review, and I didn't mean it to be. Okay, to my point earlier, somebody should have stopped me, uh, Paul. Uh, in <laughs> that, um, uh, it, it, I look forward to um, the more complicated, uh, you know, releases. And I, this was going to be a, a proving ground. This is going to test old world for me, and I think it has proved that. I do. I, I actually want to read more about this. I'm not going to bounce off this, but rather it's going to pull me in, which I'm certain is what what their goal was. But ooh, get me out of here. Cut me loose. So I'm going to actually have a negative take. Uh, <gasps> I don't usually do this. He's doing it. Uh, but I, I started reading the Arcane Journal, 
And I could tell that it was a Forge World book because it felt like it was written by multiple people. The first couple pages, I had a real hard time getting into the Tomb King's Arcane Journal, and then it picked up, and then I really appreciated it. Um, I, I, I feel like there was either a replacement or something else going on. Um, I immediately was like, oh, this is not an AOS Battle Tome, right? Oh, yeah. We read AOS Battle Tomes every single release. And I, I know the Don't flow. sound so excited, man. I, 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 <laughs> I love the AOS Battle Tomes. Like, we're really getting yeah. into the flow of they know what they're doing, they know how they're doing it, and there is a formula to how these things are happening, right? And to me, for the Tomb Kings, I haven't read the other ones yet, um, but for the Tomb Kings, I felt like this is a first, right? I feel like this is a, we're figuring out how this is going to work. And I was reading it, I was just like, this feels a little clunky. It feels a little not polished to me. And then I got further on and I was like, okay, we're getting there now. Like, I feel like I'm getting into it. And then when we got into the the core rule book, it really started accelerating. I'm like, okay, I'm getting excited about it again. I'm getting excited about reading this lore. But there was a moment where I was like, oh, like, am, am I really going to enjoy reading this? And it quickly accelerated, which I was super thankful for. But there was definitely a moment where I was like, oh, this is definitely not AOS. This is not a oiled, well, well put together machine that is knowing what's going on. And for me, that was a little bit of like, oh, all right. But then, like I said, it straightened out and it went super great from that point on so isn't isn't that kind of a funny departure in that like a lot of people thought that's what aos was when you get into aos like mm-hmm. right at the beginning yeah. the initial like yes. you go into AOS and you're like well this is not a polished thing and to think that how the roles were reversed right and we are now comparing old world to aos and be like well it's not as polished as what like i'm used to it's funny that mm-hmm. the shoe's on the other foot a little bit sorry go ahead i, I was just gonna say do you want to circle this just to the the lore for now because my how it's presented, I have a different opinion from how I feel about the lore itself as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, Tristan, how, uh, what do you think? I think um, they are going about it a very different way in comparison to AOS. I wouldn't even consider it a deeper way um, because with the AOS uh, books, I find like they get into like some grander ideas than this one does. I do find that it's a very different way of bringing things out. I compare it to uh, the band called the weaker thans, which is a very hyper specific band. Like they sing songs about like replacing batteries in smoke alarms. To me, that's kind of what um, the old world almost is like they're very specific on what they're going into but they're giving it to you in these little blurbs like everything is a like a f- about four or five paragraph little chunk that you're getting you don't get the same little tiny hooks in the arcane journals that you do in a battle tome because i find with aos battle tomes like you're getting all the little story hooks you're getting all the little vignettes that are littered all throughout with the um arcane journals you're getting more of like short stands as short stories like you're getting more of a like this is an explainer for this this is an explainer for this it's very much a surface level explanation of the tomb kings in the rule book and in the arcane journal in comparison to some of the like even some of the older books like i know being a gigantic dork of course i have i'm saying that but i think this is a great jumping in point for people who are interested in tomb kings to then go on and find more i think that the unit entries give you a nice little bit of spot of flavor but again like those almost don't have enough like i find this to be like to be a nice waiting in point for the old world and Mm -hmm. i think it's really like i think paul made a great point that this is definitely like the first version of these things just like how with those first few battle tomes like the sylvaneth one back whenever it was the first like big battle tome that they were fully figured out how they wanted to present battle tomes way back in like four or five years ago um and with that book it wasn't ironed out well but they kind of were finding their form i feel like mm-hmm. this really is them finding their form and i just think it's uh yeah um I really like it. I think it's a nice way to present all the things. I'm really excited to get my hard copy because I know for me, I retain information a lot more when I'm looking at it on a page because mm-hmm. of a certain age. But 
I think that these are going to be really fun books for people to get into the system with and to get into the lore with. And I know for me, it was just like, I was catching a whole bunch of these nice little things that are just like, oh, I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. Or, ooh, this is different. This is different. Mm -hmm. My little detectors were going off. I remember Tyler Mengel. Yeah. Yeah. Like, look at here. Look at. I remember Tyler Mengel was the first person that I knew that uh, noticed that King Fire had switched cities for some reason. And he was like, but wait a second. (laughs) And he was like, oh, wait, that happened actually a really long time ago. And for me, um, I remember being thrown. I was like, but wait, Camry is the first city that got built? That's not right. (laughs) Because I like I'd been reading like the six step one a lot, so it's it's fun seeing these nice little different things, Um, and I know that uh, for me it's just been it's just been very different compared to an Aos Battle Tome because I know I like I go through those things like front to back. I love getting Mm -hmm. all the little hooks for them. Like I've got a little document that's our like if I want to convert things in the future, what insane things have been in books. and it's just it's neat but you don't get as much of that in these things like mm. you present it very matter of factly but they do give you these nice big stanzas uh, to read like i think this is an excellent bathroom reader <laughs> um i'm gonna ask this question just so darth alec knows we asked it but everyone i think answered it in their previous answer which is do you feel the new material is a decent intro for new players yeah, yep. I think this is like the probably the best entry point into uh, this setting as a whole is like the way these books are laid out. I would argue. Well, I don't know if this is true. You guys can disagree with me. I would say that maybe not. I disagree. Not that they're, not that they're only no, got me. <laughs> I, not that they're only good for new players, but I think they're specifically made for new players. Yeah. I don't know that they are as good for not new players. When Paul talks about his what how he was feeling about when he was reading it, I wonder how much of that feeling comes from the fact that you probably knew a lot of this mm-hmm. and like you were just reading it again, and maybe that doesn't like light you up as much. I wonder. Not to I, I do think up. that interestingly, I think that the lore of it is really good for new players and the way the books are actually built to go like to go through mm-hmm. oh boy i nope. agree with that yeah, yeah. yeah. Fair. Ah, yeah. nope yeah <laughs> but that's that's for a different show <laughs> <laughs> well and, and, and it's a it's kind of a weird thing right where this is the first time that we have a gw game where they're writing lore that already exists if you want to know more it's there you can find it right Um, You can find all these different things and they're essentially um, rewriting it, right? Because they have to. Uh, There are a lot of, like like I said at the very beginning of the show, right? There's a lot of things that were written in the 80s and the 90s that do not work today. Mm They are not considered okay. They are not considered reasonable, right? And that's fair. So we need to rewrite it. But it's much easier to rewrite when this other catalog of all everything goes on, right? Like Sahenismet is a perfect example of this, right? I wanted Sahenismet. You don't have it. It's fine. I can still make Sahenismet because you know what? 20 years ago, you published, this is what Sahenismet is. This is how you convert Sahenismet, right? So you can write an arcane journal that has only, you know, like 20 pages of lore, and it's okay because I can go back and be like, yeah, but I want to find out more and I can find it. Right. Yep. Here's a thought, Paul. Mm-hmm. Um, so Sahana's bet was released in a white dwarf. Mm-hmm. That is something that they could release in a white dwarf. Mm-hmm. Bum, bum, bum. Yes. And, and that's what you can do with Forge World. Like Forge World is not like, and this is perhaps a specific thing and a thought that I have. Right which is that it is Games Workshop versus Forge World. I know there's all this conversation of whether or not Forge World still exists, whether or not it's specialist games, right? But it, it obviously Specialist design is, studios, yes. Right, yeah. exactly. Whether, like, there is obviously an intent to have it something separate than AOS, right? That is very clear because it is a new game. We are also seeing White Dwarf become far more content-driven to be able to add content to games, Right. So, yes, absolutely. Whereas before, it wasn't a thing that you would add this. Right. When Warhammer Fantasy Battles was a thing, you could definitely add it through White Dwarf. Nobody would ever play it. 
because they'd be like, oh, I can't play this at a tournament. No, I'm not going to do it. I literally begged people to play this army against me in hmm. Warhammer Fantasy Battles because it looks cool. Play it. Oh, I can't take it to a tournament. No. Right? And this is what excites me about the old world. It's not that the old world is being relaunched because the old world still exists. You have all of these books, all of these documents, all of this history. You can still play the old world, right? What I love is the idea that the old world is going to be reinvented and recreated now in a space where narrative gaming exists. It's not some basement idea that two guys have. And then when they talk to other people, they don't know what's going on. The idea that you can make something because it's cool is real. And other people will understand, oh, actually, there's some rules here. We'll make an anvil of apotheosis hero for Sahanismet and we'll have some fun, right? That is where the excitement comes for me, is we are not the gamers that we were when Warhammer Fantasy Battles existed and ended, we are now in a different era. And that is super exciting. So and I have a lot less that. hair. Yeah. And that's why you feel like the new material is decent for new players. Exactly. Because it's Drive introducing something that wasn't possible before in a way that is digestible. Because let's be honest, Nobody could get into Warhammer Fantasy Battles in 8th edition because there was so much background and so much area and so much demigriffs can't exist because we would have known about them by now. Right? Oh, yeah. We're losing that, yeah. that right? And But they're and, so cool and I got a box right over there. Exactly. Right? They're amazing. Who cares? Like, I'm a lore guy, but who cares? You made a cool new model that makes something cool. Great. Now we have that space to do that. Please, thank you. Yes. Nice. Yeah. Any other questions? Keep um, yeah, there's uh, just two left. Uh, last one from Darth Alec is, do the characters feel different in the old world versus Age of Sigmar? Uh, Nagash specifically does not. He's still a bum. Still a bum. <laughs> no one likes him still. Uh, ding, ding. But to kind of like broaden that out of characters in general, I would say a bit, because Age of Sigmar has a thing where it's like the types of characters you see are either super powerful god level characters or super ground level characters. And with the Tomb Kings, we're seeing the in between with mm. these immortal undead kings who have conquered and have done all this stuff, but are still human and are not divine. And I think there is Tomb King specifically. Except for maybe, ground. Yeah. Except for maybe Satra who can cleanse rivers and stuff with a wave of his hand but we don't need to get into that wait can you not do that <laughs> oh I mean, i've been doing oh, it all day gosh. yeah yeah oh my back is hurt from all the rivers i don't call them from great uh, lakes for nothing um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i don't disagree with that that's, no, that's a really same, great point i mean I, there are middle ground characters in age of sigmar yeah too though right like i mean think about like what we're seeing in well john bringers is a lot of ground level people but yeah. i mean i guess you could say that stormcasts are kind of a middle ground right they're not Interestingly, yeah, gods, but I'm not trying to poke holes. I don't. No, for sure. I don't care. I don't care to make no. the distinction. But um, so, but I could I could see that. Um, do the characters feel different in the old world? No, I mean I think it's still Warhammer, right? And Warhammer still yeah. has that that it's a combination of you think you're grounded until it's over the top again, right? Like it, it's it's silly in places and over serious in other places, and so I think we're still seeing some of that. Um, I know for me, I feel like these ones are a bit more set in stone, like they mm, are who they yeah. are. And I yeah. don't see like I don't uh, I'm not expecting a bunch of big changes. Like I'm not expecting like a, an evolution of anybody. I'm not expecting like I to me, there's almost like a malleability to Age of Sigmar characters. Mm -hmm. and these I'm feeling like a little bit more um, not sedentary, but just like a very firm like stationary plonk stationary thank you what yeah. better word with also sounds the same um <laughs> and yeah i just feel like they're a lot lot more stationary than aos characters because yeah snapshots in time is really uh what you're gonna get you're not gonna get a, we're not gonna get character growth here anyways like maybe between here and what you know the end of that's gonna try and times Aaron. don't call it something else call it what it is um like yep. maybe there's character character growth between here and there but like honestly that was also a little bit of a hallmark of warhammer fantasy that there wasn't a lot of growth even yeah. across the entirety of the history there like i guess the comparison is we wouldn't get 
a version of like Kragnos in the old world. And by that, I mean a super powerful world ending threat who like shows up out of nowhere because we know what happens after this in the old world. Mm-hmm. We know there wasn't anyone like that. So True. we're not going to be like Tristan said, no real big surprises. I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit. How dare you? So the reason I'm going to push back is because Tom Rakan exists, right? And this is why I'm excited that it's a specialist games because Tom Rakan was a world ending threat, right? They treated it as an alternate timeline, but I think that GW has understood itself to the point where we can have not necessarily world ending, right? Like I, I think that's not a great choice at this point, but we can have, you know, we could recreate, for example, the destruction of Solent as a historical thing that happened, right? We have the border princes, we have all these other places. And because we have these writers, these rules designers who are passionate still about the old world, obviously, if they weren't passionate, this game wouldn't be made, right? They know the spaces where these ex- where these things exist, right? One of the big things, if you're reading through, you know, the, just the kind of overview of what's going on in the old world is they're talking about cafe. And they're talking mm-hmm. about this is where cafe comes from, right? And the reason why that excites me is because nobody knows what happened in cafe mm-hmm. because nobody ever talked about it. And this is how you make cool things happen is by putting in spaces that were not filled out before and have cool things happen there. Right. Yes. Again. Yes. Please. Thank you. Have some fun. Make some cool stories. Make cool things happen and make a history again. That that sounds amazing to me. Yeah. Just make history. Yes. And (laughs) just make history. Yes. And. Yeah, the the final question I see Tristan, you already answered in the notes are what are the chances this revival will dispel the memes of folks not being annoyed about Cetra? That comes from Sage Mutt 14. And the answer is a big old goose egg. Uh, I mean, when you bring back them, like obviously people are going to meme again. It's zero percent. Yeah. Because everyone's going to be like, oh, wait, Cetra? He is that badass. He is that guy. He is that dog. That dog may have been ripped out of him. His head may have been the only thing that's left of him. But you know what? That dog's still there. Mm-hmm. He's that guy. That dog will hunt. Surf's up. <laughs> yeah. And that brings us to uh, the end. If people want to read more about the Tomb Kings uh, in any Black Library books, and I'm sure uh, they do have any examples, yeah, please do. Um, I mean, any specific ones they should look for. Well, I think that a great one to look for is the brand new one that's dropping on release day. That's the Lords of the Lance. They mm-hmm. are campaigning going into the uh, Nakarin Sands. So I think that's a great place to start because it's going to be the brand new timeline, the brand new everything. Great. Probably going to be a spot to f- figure it out. It's not it doesn't have them as like a main character. If you want main character focus, you probably want to hit up the rise of the gas trilogy, which is apparently a great trilogy. I haven't read it cause I don't mm-hmm. want to listen to that herb. Um, <laughs> and other than that, there's the stone cold classic. That is a Gotrek and Felix novel. Who doesn't love a buddy comedy Oh um, sure. called buddy the cop. serpent queen, which has high queen Kalita. Uh, she will mm. come again. And then there's also her cousin, Neferata. She also has a book. So those are kind of like my main suggestions for people if they want to do Black Library books. Probably those ones. I know I'm picking up the Lords of the Lance. I'm really excited to read it. Yeah, I'm excited for that one as well. Um, I am going to recommend an End Times book um, because there was an awesome End Times book for Cetra. And I really enjoyed it. I, I was on the combat phase, redoing, re, reviewing it with Kenny. And it was a really good book. And I still remember to this day how much fun it was. So um, absolutely. Like if you want to see where he's going, but you also want to fill in the space of like how awesome he could be. Absolutely. Um what book's that? Yeah. Um, I believe uh, it is the oh, I got him. Gash one. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the end times uh, the Gash book is whenever the Tomb King stuff kind of pops off. Well, but it's actually not the GW oh, yeah. book. It's the black time. It's the Black Library book. 
Yeah, now, yeah. speaking of which, all right, I wanted to spell a quick thing, right? How dare Which, this is a little thing that's always bothered me. It, In the end The times, chances of this being little are zip, zip. I will try. I will desperately try. I hated when the end times happened and everybody saw the book about uh, vampire counts versus Tim Kings and went, oh, this is boring because it's undead versus undead, right? Because... Tomb Kings are cool because they are not just undead, right? One of the things that is amazing about them is that they are the souls of the living bound into their undead bodies, right? So the thing and the great tragedy of that book to me is that when every time that the vampire counts would kill a Tomb King, that was a nigh-immortal soul that had then been ripped from its physical body that had lived for thousands of years. And that is the great tragedy of the end times book. And if you're looking for a reason why the tomb Kings are cool, and they are not just Egyptian undead. That is the reason there because they are bound into their bodies. They are still the people who they were in life and they are living this thousand-year-old history. So that, to me, has always been the coolest thing about Tim Kings. And if that sounds cool, absolutely read that. Uh, Nagash the Undying King is what I'm seeing. That's for Age of Sigmar. That's the Age of Sigmar. You're oh, looking wrong. for the return of yep. Nagash, I believe. The return of the Nagash. Thank you, but yes. Joshy Reynolds is the name I just ascribed to him because he's not in the scene anymore, so he can't stop me. <laughs> he's tried. Can't, <laughs> be <done. laughs> can't, can't be overcome. Um, yeah, and then with that being said, we go to our review and highlights. Just kind of going off the list based on my screen, uh, Aaron. Hey, that's me, and also alphabetical. Um, I think I already gave my little blurb in terms of what I thought about it. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything to add. I think it. I think the, the true test of this, and then maybe the great experiment of what the old world is going to be, is can we can they create something to get people like who are maybe on the fence or just curious about the old world. Is this enough to draw them in or are they going to bounce off it? Um, and I think they probably struck the right balance. They, I think me personally, they could have dialed it up to be a little more detailed or specific or like in depth, but that I'm not most people. Uh, I'm cooler than most people. Um, so like, I think they should probably struck the right balance in terms of the level of depth uh, for like your average new curious uh old worlder um so because of that i think they probably did it right i think that remains to be seen though i'll be curious to see like what how the community reacts to a lot of this stuff both from i guess we're talking about the lore here specifically but obviously the whole thing is really going to be interesting so i'm glad i'm around to experience it and watch it if nothing else it's going to be a fun like fun ride to observe um but uh it also is but at the same time it's not gonna like steal me away from age of sigmar too i think that might be a threat that some people talk about but i don't at least for me personally i know where my home is currently i will i will dabble i will watch but i think i'm still hooked where i'm hooked so that's where i'm at oh I, in terms of I, I i enjoyed it i think it was a good read and i'm looking forward to reading some of the other ones too when they come out uh paul i would probably go with five out of eight spider legs oh i didn't read it um like i said it, it definitely feels like a first book um i'm not disappointed in it by any means uh, but I think that there is more meat on the bone that did not get explored. And I am, I, I know I'm literally stealing your, <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I want to see that explored. I, I want to see this through line. I want to see a narrative. I want to see cool things happen. I want to see people die. I want to see nations rise. Yes, please. I think this is, yeah, I think this has been a really great introduction to the world. It's a really nice for them to focus on my favorite thing. I know I, <laughs> like they owed you frankly so oh god uh, listen i'm not a, i i'm accepting gifts but i'm not uh, <laughs> i'm not expecting them no. um but for me i know i was shocked whenever i found out the tomb kings were actually coming back mm -hmm. um i was jumping for joy i never thought i'd see the day because after the bone reapers got released i was like oh well there goes any chance i have of getting the thing that i like right. and so it's been a very crazy experience for me to actually experience getting to be a part of the hype cycle getting to be a part of the like the community as they're rising up talking about their favorite things being like oh did you see this oh did you see that and i'm just it's like kind of like this because i feel like a little bit of an outsider even in the age of sigmar community because like my favorite things are tomb kings but my favorite game is age of sigmar and for 
me, this book has just been like me rolling around in a little pile of joy. <laughs> and I've just been so tickled with like, just like I'm doing dorky things like checking out the YouTube series of mm-hmm. like how to paint a tomb king from the from the powers that be. And like, I don't need to see that. I, I have like 18 different ways to paint bone. Um, but this book, like these books specifically, I think are a great a great little love song to tomb kings to how they've been before to how they'll be in the future that for what they for the constraints that they were given i feel like they did a really good job as a starting point Mm -hmm. i know i'm so excited to see where they go with this how they deliver out more information because there's such a depth to this army that I feel like they will be able to explore more in the future. Mm -hmm. And like with having no Queen Kalita in it, it's like, there's a pretty, pretty easy way to uh, jump off with that. I just think it's going to be a really fun thing to see where they go. And I know I am just, I'll, I'm hooked for the ride. Uh, Like saying, same with you, Aaron. I know I'm still very much like, AOS is my one true love whenever it comes to games because I love this. I love the gameplay. Like I love the round and pound, as somebody coined it the other day, um, <laughs> as opposed to the rank and flank. Rank and flank, yeah, I get um, it. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's um, I think that was Rob from Modest War Gamer. Mm-hmm. Um, and by I think, I mean I know that. But he, um, I think for me, this is just such a fun setting to get into. And I'm really excited to see how they weave the story. Like the idea that there's going to be a through one into each book. Oh, baby. Am I excited for that? It's just, oh, I'm just tickled. I guess that, that my summation is I'm tickled. And yeah. Tickle pink. I just want to get all of the things. <laughs> so, uh, Will I? Over you, over you, Will. So I really love all the lore that are in these books. Like just to mirror what everyone said, what I said earlier, I think it's great. It's a great starting off point. Um, I never played Warhammer fantasy battles when, by the time I had money, I, I got out of the army, came back home and it was the summer of 2015. And that's when age of Sigmar started. So I'm like, Oh, cool. I just jumped into that directly. (laughs) So for me, this is a great introduction to what this faction is, what they do, giving me some of that history. The biggest knock I can have on it is, that it's kind of split up in three different books, uh, which isn't the greatest entry point for a new person. I'm only better because I had to make the notes and I had to find (laughs) a way to organize it in a way that made sense. So like, but that's the only thing I would knock against what is here is just the way that it's packaged. What is inside is amazing. And because of that, I'm going to give it five out of the six uh, cities of Nehekara. Excellent. It's cute that you only think there's six. Yeah, I was, you know, I, I was, I was trying to think I was going to make a joke map. about it. Yeah. How's that? <laughs> there's six that are above ground. Oh, you sweet summer child. Nice. Um, but it is time for our reforging, but Sigmar Willing will be back soon. Like, subscribe, share, or leave a review. Join us on our Discord. Drop a tip on our Patreon. Anything you can do will spread the word of Sigmar farther than we can on our own. Chat with us anytime online at The Mortal Realms or Paul. Where can they find you? At PJ Shard. Aaron. Um, Aaron, you can find me on Twitter. I, for how much longer? Who's to say at Dose Sos? Tristan. On Twitter, I'm at Tristan Gray. And on Instagram and a lot of other other places i'm at tomb king tristan yep, and you can find me on twitter at age of sever or blue sky simply at sever and you can find all of our mortal realm shows and content at the mortal realms.com uh, hey i got a bunch of knives i can throw them we right recorded here. that in a different thing that wasn't true and, and some kind of heavy vest there you go yeah mm-hmm. uh it's called a child yes I'm so wearing a baby armor, armor with Kevlar. Oh, the baby's in there. It's your baby yeah. armor? Nice. Yeah. I love the baby armor. I didn't realize the baby was in <laughs> that, it. That goes <laughs> super dark now. Yeah. <laughs> Kevlar the baby armor. Now I feel bad about myself. It hurts. Deep in my heart, That's another dollar. I will believe. That's a dollar. Aaron uh, is controlling me. What was he pointing at? Where was he? I don't know. I was grabbing a fly. Uh, oh, nice. Did, did you do it? it? Did you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Nice. No, yeah. Wait, what? And it's what? Uh, it was not being so, recorded, so no one will ever know. Um, no, I did it. Yep. It's cool. Oh. It's dead. I don't know. I do that. It's fun. Um, <laughs> this is some karate nice. kid nonsense. Um, <laughs>